Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number four of the Bearded Gear podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined by my good friend, MB Wild. Uh, that is his Instagram handle, so that is going to help you guys to find him if you look for him on Instagram. Um, MB and I have been in a group chat now for at least a couple of months, and we have a lot of really interesting conversations, some of the time in the group chat, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. He has a mind that I really appreciate and enjoy. Um, for purposes of anonymity, you won't be seeing his face today, and I'm going to refer to him just as MB. Um, but yeah, MB, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Hey, Jake, I'm doing good, and I'm glad to be here chatting with you. The pleasure is all mine, my friend. Um, so I've alluded to the fact that I'm going to be doing this podcast for a little bit now. I talked about it um, in my previous two podcasts that it was coming, <laughs> um, both with Kevin and Kyle, and then again with Sean from Geared Toward Gear. I talked about how I'd be doing kind of a deep dive with one of my friends about Chris Reeve knives. And this really came up a couple of weeks ago in our group chat. A, a conversation just kind of sparked about Chris Reeve knives. And I think MB, you actually started it because you had just gotten your um, nums on. Am I right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and <laughs> so you've had how many Chris Reeve knives at this point? Uh, all of them, but the, uh, all of them, but the, let me see. I don't remember the model name, but it's the, the lockback, I think. Okay. Have So have you even had like their slip joint or whatever? The no, so yeah, this the there's a slip joint, and then there's one other that I have the little ones, but all of their major lineups I have had and had multiple copies of. Okay, so you've had a Sabenza, you've had an Incosi, you've had a Zan mm -hmm. now. Um, yep. I feel like those are the main three. Am I missing any? Yep, no, and then a few different versions of those. So I've had okay. the Micarta version of the Sabenza and a few different blade types, uh, different inlays, yeah. Gotcha. So the last one that you really needed to check out of their like primary folder line was the Zan. And what happened when you got that knife? Oh man. Okay. Well, so yeah, so let's thump the hornet's nest here. Um, <laughs> so I was looking forward to it. So like you, I do a lot of trading. I do a lot of reviewing. I want to bring things in. I want to study them. I want to figure out the designer's intent. I want to figure out what separates the winners from the losers with a lot of different brands and companies. And, you know, $450, $500 is a lot to spend on a knife. And while I think people believe that reviewers are just made out of money and people are sending us stuff for free at every turn that, you know, the truth is, is that we have to be smart traders and we have to pass things on. I think it, at least for me, I assume it for you, but it makes me very sensitive to what quality is. Mm-hmm. And one of the knives that I really wanted to get my hands on was a Noom Nooms on. And I've just heard so many good things about it from the people that have owned it. And I love the look of it. I love harpoon blades. Um, to me, it just looks like it's going to feel like a fixed blade when you, when you get it open. And so I finally find one and I trade for it and I sell something that I really like in order to get a hold of this one. And it, it shows up and the box lands in front of me. And I open it up and I was pissed. I mean, I really was because here is this beautiful knife, un undoubtedly beautiful to look at without question, beautiful, you know, materials, uh, the scale pattern, the size was perfect. I mean, this should be my knife, my sidekick in the adventure movie. And instead the action on it was so incredibly terrible the first moment it, you know, people had this thing where, oh yeah, you get Sabenza thumb. That's a thing. No, no, this was different. This was literally a $500 plus knife that had hands down the worst action that has ever been shipped to me from any company in the history of knife making. And it was kind of a little bit of a final straw for me in terms of, you know, being willing to try out their line. And that's the point where I said, yeah, I know we are thumping a hornet's nest a little bit, but somebody needs to have a talk about what does 450 or five to about $550 of value look like in the knife world today, because this just can't be it. Absolutely. So um, I think I should preface me going into this as well with some back history for people who are newer to my channel or haven't watched all of my 400 plus videos at this point that I've made. Um, but toward the beginning of me starting my knife review channel on YouTube, 
I decided to do a week long carry challenge with a Sabenza. And so a buddy of mine loaned me his, it was a user that I was welcome to carry still in great shape, but it wasn't like a, a knife I wasn't allowed to carry and use, which was great. Cause I wanted to see kind of what it was made of. And I went into it trying to see if I was missing anything on the Sabenza because for the entire time that I've been in the knife, like Instagram community and kind of the the center of the hobby, hearing what people's people have to say and watching reviews and all of that. I've just been hearing so many things about the Sabenza. And even previous to really being in the hobby, the Sabenza was one of the few nice knives that I knew existed that wasn't from like Spider Co or Benchmade. Um, and and it was just kind of a knife that was like on my radar. And so for a long time it was uh, grail is the wrong term, but it was a knife that like in my head, I knew was really nice. And I kind of anticipated owning one day, but then I, I feel like I missed the curve on it a little bit because I went from collecting knives and having a lot of bench mates and spider co's and ZTs and stuff kind of in that range to then jumping to like, I got some Olamics and then I got my Koenig Arius. And I feel like I surpassed yeah. really where the Chris Reeve was in terms of like the order of my progression. Yeah. So when I came back to it, it was to find out if I had been missing something because I still all the time, even today, hear so many just incredibly positive remarks about the Chris Reeve and claims of it being the best EDC knife ever and all these like anecdotal things that get thrown around about it. It's ab absolutely a famous knife at this point. So anyway, I did this video series where I spent a week with it. I started by showing the knife off at first and talking about where I was kind of coming into the experience from. And this is one of the reasons why now uh, my video sequence goes in the order of unboxing, first impressions, full review. And the full review isn't until at least a week after I've unboxed the knife because I did a, a first impressions and a kind of uh, a voicing of all the things I had been told about the Chris Reeve and what I was going into it uh, knowledge wise with. And then I did like a, a check in in the middle, like, hey, it's been a couple of days. Here's what I'm finding. Here's kind of what I'm figuring out about it. Here's how I'm feeling. Right. And then I did a wrap up at the end where I talked about the knife and, and where I came to it conclusion wise. Um, looking back on that video, I think I was nicer then than I would be now <laughs> as a reviewer in terms of I really wanted to take care to make sure people understood that it wasn't an attack on anyone personally that I was saying I didn't like the Sabenza but I didn't like this Sabenza. Um, and I feel like the Sabenza 21 that I tried was a, a, a proper one to try. That's a, a hallmark model for them, right? And uh, ever since that time, I've had a lot of interactions with people, some of which were in the comment section of those videos, other places online. And a lot of people want to engage about Chris Reeve knives. So I've been fed all of these reasons why Chris Reeve knives is the best. And I try to playfully and, and in the right space at the right time, kind of combat that a little bit and shed some light on why I don't think <laughs> it's the greatest knife ever. Um, but I think it's important for people to know that both you and I have come into this, not wanting to roast Chris Reeve knives. This isn't going to be just putting them on blast or, or anything of the sort, but we've kind of, through our conversations, I think kind of established a spot where we think Chris Reeve knives actually belongs in the marketplace and where frankly it is. But I think the perception is what I find to be flawed about it. And so I think we're going to kind of discuss what may be the proper perception of what that brand is and what kind of knives they make and how competitive they are and to whom they're competitive. And, and so I think we're going to hopefully paint a picture through that, but each of us now has a history with them. I've frankly only tried the one. The only Umnumzan that I ever handled was at California Custom Knife Show a couple of years ago. I picked it up because I was interested in it at the time. And the way that the lock bar tab sits so proud of the show scale was yeah. like, for my hand, a glaring hotspot. And I set it right back down and walked away. I, I had no interest in it with that one feature alone. I didn't give it a proper carry challenge like I did the Sabenza 21, but right. I, I already knew that knife kind of isn't for me as soon as I held that, which may be fair, maybe unfair, but we've each had our experiences and we've probably both had plenty of experiences talking to people about these knives. So I, hopefully that paints a little bit of a picture. Do you think that's a <laughs> good jumping off point? Yeah, it, it really is. And the one thing I would add there, maybe just one or two things to add is, 
first of all, at least with my work that I put out in the knife community, I try to focus on positive things. I think that there's just more value in looking at what works and what's worth your time and attention than on things that I don't prefer. I know some people make their stock and trade and, and I don't think this is totally unfair. I think some people take in knowledge about the world by noticing what's wrong with it. And that's not always a bad thing. And they come across as very negative, but that's just not me. Um, I can be very harsh. You know, I work in a design field. I evaluate design a lot. Um, I can be very harsh personally, one-on-one -on -one with an object, but I don't like to focus on the negative. And I don't think that the intent in any way is to try to fault find, especially at some kind of a shallow level with Chris Reeve knives. So I would agree with you there. To me, what I'm seeing is people are saving up for a long time for these knives and they're going after a grail and they're saying, you know, I'm getting tired of, of bug outs for, you know, and I want to go after something that I can pass down and have pride in and that I really care about. And I'm going to say, I'm going to save up 400 or 550 bucks and my husband or my wife is going to be furious with me, but I'm going to do it anyway. And they get it in their hand and they go, what? And there is some good things that come out of interacting with them. But I think what happens is that it opens a doorway for people where they go, what happened here? I thought that this was going to be everything. Yeah. And, it, and it's not. And so that's the, you know, I would love to come at that question with curiosity and just use Chris Reeve Knife as a benchmark and put it into context for people. Right. I feel like that has value. I think what can also happen sometimes, uh, which... I don't know what the frequency of it is, but I'd be willing to bet there are a, quite a few people who have made that jump. They've decided to purchase their grail. They've gotten it in hand. They spent what to them was a, a lot of money on the uh, on the knife, right? And then it gets there. And I think they're, for a lot of people, their reaction may be negative, like you just said. But I think a lot of people do quite a bit of convincing themselves that it is actually good. Because they've been fed so many talking points on why it's good. My friend Jason, in his review of the Encosi, talked about creating a feature out of a flaw as like a sales technique. And so I think a lot of people experience some of the features of the Sabenza. And a lot of like reviewers are pretty accurate at describing how it feels and, and kind of what it's like. But I think they played it in a way that's very positive. Whereas to a lot of people, myself included, a lot of the positives about the Sabenza that people say are positives are to me negatives, like the action and, and certain things about it. And so people get it and they experience it and it's different than other knives. I would venture to say in some ways worse for my preferences, but it's different. And so they, they because they just spent so much money on it and they want to yeah. justify it, they may jump to the, oh, this is what nice feels like. And then they start repeating mm -hmm. The thing. Oh man, it's such a good point. And one thing I would add there is when you look at the research on how we come to understand quality of something, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because there's this, there's this brief concept that pops up that I have to use in my regular work all the time. And that is when something is very complicated and ambiguous to us, when we don't really mm -hmm. understand what makes it tick, we lean on brands. Mm -hmm. So if I don't know exactly how many Wizard Hertz is in a TV, and the salesman saying, oh yeah, this goes to the third triclometer scale on the OLED black scale. And I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. I want a Sony. I'm gonna lean on a Rolex, give me a Rolex. I don't mm -hmm. understand the difference between an ETA movement and a, uh, you know, a Japanese movement. And so I'm gonna grab a brand and I'm gonna hang on for dear life to avoid the complexity of it. But something happens when we acquire knowledge of something. And what happens is we actually take pride in not leaning on a brand. It's a very sharp switch that happens. So you see this with people who build their computers all the time. I figured out the best graphics card. I figured out the best sound card. I figured out by far the, the, the best SSD drive and, the, and they're all made by different companies. And look, I built this computer and it came in a thousand dollars less than what you walk into Best Buy and buy, but it is twice as fast mm -hmm. and we understand it. And I think what happens is when you jump into a certain level of knife making, there is an art involved and there's different materials. We all have a different context of use. Some of us need it very anti-corrosive. Some don't notice that at all. And we don't know what to do. And I think people lean on a brand. And I think CRK is a very easy brand to lean on. 
And my argument is, but if people understood what quality was in 2021 in knife making, then you can home build your computer. You can get so much more value for even a lot less money. And that is the kind of that, that transition I think people make when they buy that first CRK, they're buying the brand and they do, I think they try to spin flaws into features. They try to educate themselves. They, they try to reset their, ooh, so the more you pay for a knife, the worse the action must become. <laughs> oh, this is very nice. How you know it's good. It has how you know it's good. Instead of understanding how does an action work? You have a detent ball, you have a ramp, you have a channel, you have lock bar, which has a certain amount of pressure. And when these things come together, you have 20 different knives. There's so much variability that all 20 knives can have very different feeling actions. It's part of the fun of exploring these designs. But if you look at the group as a whole for, for $350 and above, you have access to some incredible actions. And then you get to this $550 knife and it will barely open. And people even take the wound that you get trying and they call it sabenzathum. And it's this wonderful thing that happens when you spend your money on it. That's where I think we start to get a little dishonest. Right. No, I think that's a, a very fair way of painting that picture, at least the, the way that I see it. I think you and I have, have similar <laughs> minds. So we're probably going to have a lot of common ground here. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we could go about this. And honestly, um, neither MB or myself have like a, a distinct plan. I think personally that the, the best conversations happen when you aren't following a guide or something. But I, this is one of those rare cases where I have put down a couple of notes um, of just things that I kind of want to make sure that I don't forget if we get into those, um, into those little arenas. But I think a good place to start to work off of what you just said would be defining what makes quality for you and I. Because if, if someone's listening to this podcast, I perceive if they're a fanboy, if you will, of Chris Reeve Knives, and they're just boiling at this point, um, then I think it's fair for us to say what we think quality is and what features we think add value to knives in terms of how much they should cost and what makes them good. Like if we're building our ultimate computer, how do yeah. we build it? What do we want to see? And yeah. So what would you say are the, the features or the, the qualities that you think add quality, add value to, to make a knife worth a, a premium? Oh man. So it's such a good question. And, you know, first of all, I will say that if, you know, there's a thing that happens in the human brain, it's a trick of the mind, the bias mm -hmm. that once we spend what we consider to be some risky amount of resource on something, that we try really hard to defend it. And so yeah. I understand, I'm, I'm in that group, I've spent a lot of money on Chris Reeve knives, but if anyone is listening and they say, well, now I'm mad because you don't, you don't get it. What I would say is um, I'm there, I'm not trying in any way to say, you know, well, you're a reasonable person and you spent money, so it, should, it was a reasonable position, I've done the same thing. I, I, you know, instead of attacking that, what I'd rather say is, yeah, just like you said, let's look at what quality is and then you take a look for yourself mm -hmm. and you see what you find. Let's see if we can't sharpen our designer's brain together and then dive in together and have a much broader conversation in the market about what is quality and invite Chris Reeve in, but also all of these other makers and manufacturers that are working their tails off to produce some incredible stuff. Mm -hmm. And what if we just talked about that together? And so for me, where I go, when, if you invited me into that conversation, to me, there's a couple things that begin to anchor quality. Uh, number one for me is materials involved. I think that, and very quite specifically is steel. Um, this is where contextual knowledge gets a little tricky because somebody in Arizona or Colorado can say, man, I have this V2 knife and it is amazing. I only have to sharpen it once a month and it just cuts everything and it's so beautiful. And then there's somebody in South Carolina, 97 degree heat that said, this is the biggest piece of junk I've ever held. I was halfway through a work session, didn't even pull out my knife and it was rusted closed uh, by lunch. And I've had D2 knives rust on me in that mm -hmm. same way. And so, you know, S90V, the same way. One person's gonna say, this is such a beautiful steel. I can slice open packages for a year without sharpening. Literally you can with S90V. Mm -hmm. And somebody else says, this is terrible because I cut up two boxes and I hit a staple and I get a huge gouge out of the edge. 
And do you know how long it takes to sharpen S90V on a home system? Oh yeah. And that's true. So I, I think we have to be careful of contextual knowledge. But for me, I think you need to understand the material choices involved and how well they fit your use pattern. If you need an anti-corrosive steel or you need a steel that holds its edge for a long time, and really that holds its geometry for a long time, because there's no such thing as edge retention. It's just, does it hold its geometry? Then those materials matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I also look at design for humans. I look at the designer's intent and their choices. How well does it fit a real human hand? And yeah, there's a lot of variability for sure. And you know, some people like them bigger, some people like them smaller, some people like them wider. Nonetheless, there is a reason why there are patterns in the knife making industry and, and certain things tend to work better than others. And mm -hmm. you can kind of tell if it was designed for humans to hold or for humans to look at. Right. And some really great, really great designers do both. Uh, I go for durability as well. For me, I understand that for some people that they're going to put a knife on the edge of their desk. They're only going to use their knife to open the next box that comes with a knife in it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I get that. And there's no shade thrown at that. That is a totally legitimate use. But for me, heritage quality really matters. I want something that's going to hold up. I, I hard use things. I go out in the wild a lot. I work outside a lot. Um, I don't like sitting at a desk all day. I have a very white collar job. I don't enjoy doing that um, as much. And I want something that can go with me. I also want something that I can pass down over time. I take a lot of pride in that. Uh, last thing for me that's on my list is action. So this is different than the world when I first started getting really into knives in, in you know, the early 2000s, late 90s. Um, action was tough. And it, sometimes the best action you could find was a bench made because the axis lock is a very smooth mechanism. And my only issue with the axis lock was durability. Those little springs inside, they just, yeah. they, they make me nervous. As an outdoorsman, I would go out and have a knife on me and I'd have a folding knife. And, you know, those springs just make me a little bit nervous. Sure. In 2021, it might be the biggest revolution that has happened in knives under $800 is that the actions have gotten so incredibly good mm -hmm. in the hands of the right maker. So, you know, materials, specifically steel, uh, design for humans, the durability of it and the action, I, for the most part, that's what I would be talking about if I were talking about quality. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, you and I see pretty eye to eye on most of that. Materials are very important to me. <laughs> I, uh, even for knives that, frankly, I don't use as hard as others, like I have knives that I kind of categorize for myself to make them make sense in my own brain. Right. And I've got like adventure type knives, like you said, knives that can go outdoors and can be on a, a long hike with me or could be camping with me for a week long. And that's the one folder in my pocket. How often does that happen? Not that often for me, but um, it's nice to know that gear is capable. And it, along that same thought pattern, even the knives that are like really beautiful, and might look too pretty for me to want to use them as hard as others. There's a certain satisfaction for me that comes from knowing that my knife is made from the materials that are capable of going farther than I'll take them. Even if I know I probably won't, right? Yeah. Especially with the number of knives that I own. Uh, if, if I, of all the new knives that I got were just had aluminum blades and couldn't hold an edge, <laughs> I'd still have cutting tools, plenty of them, <laughs> to be able to cut the, everything I need to for the rest of my life, right? But that would bring me no satisfaction. I don't want something that um, that can't go as far as my mind and its fantasies wants to pretend I'm in an action movie and be able to take it, right? <laughs> there's, there's a satisfaction in owning the supercar, even if you rarely take it to the track. Like, to, I, I get that. I, I, I want nice things, right? And so yeah. the reality is not all materials are created equal and they do have somewhat of a monetary ranking that at least loosely follows the ranking of how they perform. And there are different metrics of performance for steels, whether, like you said, it could be corrosion resistance, it could be edge retention, it could be toughness. Um, some people throw ease of sharpening in there. Um, I don't consider that a metric of performance. I consider it a metric of maintenance, but I, I think that the, those things are worth being considered 
when choosing a material yeah. and I don't think all are created equal. So that's important to me. Agreed. I also, uh, I enjoy good design. I'm at the point in knives. I was just having a conversation today. I went on a hike with my buddy, Nick from niche designs. We hung out for a little while after got lunch together and we talked knives for hours and hours today. It was awesome. Um, but it, something came up along the lines of, um, some knives look good and some knives feel good in hand. And that's something that you talked about. And I think in 2021, where we are right now, it is okay to demand both because options yeah. exist for both. I, I think the, the, the knives that the market is presenting to consumers right now, you can have knives that look amazing and feel and perform amazing. It's not yes. like you can have just an art knife and then like the knives I use all look ugly, but that's because I use them. The knives I use are beautiful. Some of them look more tool like than others, but I have plenty of knives that I find really attractive to look at that make fantastic yes. cutting tools and fit my hand well and all that. So like, I, I think where we're at right now, the market has kind of spoiled us, but I think I demand kind of everything from a knife. It depends on the price point that it comes at. If I'm looking at a budget knife, I have different demands. But if I'm looking at a knife that's anywhere over $300, probably for me personally, then it better look good, it better feel good, and it be better be made of what I consider premium materials. Otherwise, I'm kind of out or I'm buying it for like a joke or for the wrong reasons. You know, like I bought a knife yesterday in 440C blade steel just to check out. It was $150. It hurt me to do it. But but I did it because I'm really intrigued and I didn't know that the knife existed. And it's from years ago. It's been discontinued for a while. So like it's its own thing, right? But to me, that was not the norm. That was a weird activity for right. me to click purchase on a $150 knife that had 440 C blade steel. It was, it felt bad to me. Um, and so I think th there are values attached to materials, to fit and finish, to the way things are put together, to finishing like actual, the way things are colored and the way uh, materials yeah. are, are finished so that they feel in your hand and so that they last over time without scratching and scuffing all those things kind of matter to me personally. So there's probably a lot more I could say about value, but I think that's, does that make sense as you listening to me? So hopefully it does to the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the questions I'm gonna ask you, I don't know where you're gonna go next, but one of the questions I would ask you is to you, what are kind of those of the, you know, the, the tiers of value? Like, what do you, cause you said, well, if it's over 300, I expect this. Yeah. So do you, do you have even a loose sketch in your head of where you think the values are? Sure. So I would say, um, I would consider a budget knife personally, the line for me is a hundred bucks and below. If it's sub a okay. hundred dollars to me, that's a, a budget knife in that range. Things are acceptable like D2 and VG 10 and 440 C. Um, and right. things can be a little bit heavier for their size because they don't have like internal milling and, and features that you often find uh, take more machining and more time and all of that. So I think certain things are fair sub a hundred dollars that aren't necessarily fair above it um, unless they have some other weird captivating feature that adds to the price. But yeah, so sub a hundred bucks is budget in my mind. Once you get above that, I would say from a hundred plus to 250, maybe 300 would be what I'd consider like good normal production like high number high volume of knives being built in most cases it's a knife that a lot of people can have maybe it's a sprinter exclusive version of something um but in that range i'm looking for like usability ergos i want uh, steels that excite me because in that range you can get steels that are very exciting at this point um like especially a, a big part of why i'm a spider co fanboy admittedly is because i can get steels like 10v <laughs> on a PM2 and it cost me $160 or something. Like this is an objectively amazing steel for that amount of money. And the ergos for that knife work for me. I personally like the way it looks. I like the way it feels like that's good. But if you started to tell me now, because that knife has that steel, it's over $300. I would disagree because all that that knife has, that's really objectively nice about it, like, or fancy, if you want to call it that 
is the steel. Everything else about it is G10 and steel liners and like washers. It's it's not exciting right. otherwise in its construction. Um, so yeah, then I would say once you go north of 300 or maybe north of 350 and you start approaching price ranges like six or 700 bucks, maybe even 800, then you're into like really nice production. Uh, like my favorite knives in that range would be like my Demco 8020, which uh, kind of like the Spyderco is G10 and it has nested ish liners in it. Um, but this knife is doing interesting things. It has a new lock type that was just invented. It's made in very small numbers in the shop of the guy who invented it and his brother. Um, it uses three V blade steel, which I love. It's a absolute tank and it's uh, to me feels like the most capable of doing anything knife that i own you also find knives like the koenig arius which made in idaho in tint um yeah. and has m390 and really nice finished titanium that's contoured incredible internal milling everything about this knife feels precise and kind of magical to me i just love this knife and that i'm in for just north of 600 bucks so i look for things in that range that are not attainable in the one below it. And that's kind of how the tiers work for me. Any Once you get above that, like 800 plus maybe, I start thinking you're talking about custom knives. <laughs> um, yes. And that's not really a game that I personally play yet. I probably will at some point in my progression of knife collecting. But once you get above that range and you're looking at customs, then things start to become much more abstract in terms of how they're valued and where that value comes from because it's about this can play some role in the other categories but a lot of the time it's about the maker and whether you like that person and you like what they're about and the persona that they have or their work ethic or whatever it may be oftentimes it's about purely aesthetic i find that a lot of the customs that i've held at knife shows and stuff have felt really kind of bad to me in hand and haven't felt as capable as knives that I have even in like not budget, but maybe one tier up from that like user right. knife range. Um, and so the, the focus seems to be much more artistic and much more about makers and community and uh, like collectability and how extremely limited something is. Cause if it's a truly one-off custom, then you're the only right. one who has it. And, that value system becomes much more fluid. And I think it's, yeah. it's less Agreed. defined for me, but that's kind of where I'd put it. How about, how about yourself? You know, for, for well, first of all, I'm very good. Uh, you know, I think I'm a little similar for me, 50 to a hundred dollars is definitely your budget. And for the most part, this category is filled with junk steels, steels that the best thing you can do is learn how to sharpen on them. And, you know, you, there are some, and keep in mind in each of these categories, there are knives that outperform. And I delight in finding the ones that jump out, like the Civivi Elementum and S35, it's less than a hundred bucks. What a great knife. Um, the Giant Mouse Iona. Um, oh yeah, there you go, the Stinger, right? Yep. Um, the, the Iona, which is an M390 at a hundred bucks. So there are outliers for sure but let's talk about general patterns you're getting a, the best steel you're really finding there is either s30 or or d2 mm -hmm. then you jump into about 100 to 150 dollars and when i went through all the knives i've had in the last four or five years the patterns that i saw here a lot of s30v and s35v yep. there are some good knives here there are a few in the budget category but there are some now mm -hmm. um you you know for the most part you're you will start to experience your first good action here, usually with a Z, with a zero tolerance or with a bench made knife. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, if you spend a hundred to 150, you can go, wow, okay, something's going on here. Maybe this is worth checking out. And you'll find a knife like the Osborne, if you get it, that's a very capable cutter. Mm -hmm. um, keep in mind, by the way, that there, as we're talking, there's really three different price tiers within these. One is a new knife. I'm gonna buy it new in this price range. Second is I'm gonna pre-order a knife in this mm -hmm. price range, which is very different. And then the third is I'm gonna buy this knife off the secondary. Right. Because you know if you're gonna buy an impulse off the secondary, it can be brand new, but you're gonna pay $550 right now. Right. If you imagine, get it on pre-order. Imagine how much I could sell my brand new serial number five right. Axon for today, which I'm not yes. going to, but it would be a lot more than I paid for it. 
Yes. And, and, and yet if you were in on the pre-order, it's, you know, a $200 knife and a great knife at $200. Yeah. So keep in mind that there's some variability here. You get to 150 to, to about 225. And to me, this is tier one quality. This is where the quality really starts to show up on pattern. You're dealing with premium steels and you're dealing with great actions and great materials for the most part in this price range. And there's some duds in there mm -hmm. for sure, but you're going to start finding a lot more to be interested in. The next tier, tier two quality to me is 250 to about 450. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is the sweet spot, especially if you can get in on pre-orders, if you're willing to you know, be patient for the delivery. So you're going to pre-order it. And then the person is going to, to then build the knife and then distribute them sometime later. Now you're getting superb steels. You're getting superb actions, superb materials. You're getting heritage quality goods. I think that you can get as much value at a heritage quality level between 250 and 450 right now between the secondary market and the pre-orders that you can find at any time in the knife market to date right mm -hmm. now. I don't think there was an era where anywhere close to that number, you had so many good products clustered. Above that, you have like the 450 to 650 range and you get everything you get in the previous tier, but now you're getting something that's going to feel as good as custom. It is, you know, that's your mid-tech range. So that's where a custom maker normally will go in and hand finish things. They will get the detent ramp perfect. You're getting customized, you know, view and, and mods to it. The aesthetics of it are kind of taken to a different level. And, you know, that 450 to 650 range, if you want to splurge a little bit, you can have the action go to a different level. And then finally, you have 650 and above. And at this point, two interesting things happen. One is your steel qualities actually are going down right now. Right. And they start using steels that because it just takes so long. You're working on one knife for so long. Your steel quality goes down. Right. You, these you are not users. Hand rub on S90V. That would yeah. be awful. You'd rather do it, it on It would be terrible. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And so now you're paying for rarity. You're paying for a custom maker like Geppetto who's sitting there trying to turn this thing into a real boy. And that's fine because it's beautiful. And if there's a maker that you're in love with, then you absolutely want to see what they can do when it's just them and this thing or Olamic how they send off their brass handles sometimes to the guy in Russia and he does these custom carvings. I mean, these are works of art. They're absolutely gorgeous. And they're $1,300 for a reason because a person took hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of doing the scroll work or doing the carving. Mm -hmm. And I think you feel that quality when you hold it as humans, we go, wow, this is a thing of, of beauty and a thing to admire and a thing of an object of desire. But I don't think that objectively for the most part outside of a few, you're getting a better knife than you are in that 250 to $500 range. Right. I'd agree with that. Yeah. I think our, our categories seem to line up pretty similarly. Yep. Um, yeah. I, it is interesting that you notice the steels, uh, not unanimous, not unanimously, but often drop off once you yes. get into the customs range. Because I think it's also an evidence of the type of buyer for those knives. I think if all of a sudden the buyers of custom knives started to demand higher end steels on their customs, mm -hmm. they would get them. And the cost might increase a, a little bit from where they are now. But I think it's because the expectation of those knives is that they're going to sit in beautiful cases and be looked at and they might be flipped around inside the house. And some people do carry them, but they don't cut with them all that much. And um, the ones well, who people do- People will handle them. them with gloves. You <laughs> will see people put, I mean, it, and if, look, if you spend $1,500 on a hand rub slip joint, yeah, you know what? I'm not gonna be cutting zip ties with it. I'm just not. Right. Because I need to, I need to be able to resell that at some point for close to its value in order to buy my next thirteen hundred slip joint. Right. Yeah. So I just, I do think it's interesting. I do think, however, in even just the last few years, part of why steels have uh, trickled down so much to where you can get really, really impressive steels at relatively budget <laughs> limits of price is because that market has demanded it. Whereas the yes. the custom market hasn't at all. 
that I don't hear people clamoring for like, oh, they're only using 154 cm on this crazy hand rub, beautiful mirror polish. To like, it, it's it's less about blade steel there, and it's more. I mean, there's also like tons of Damascus and stuff, which looks really beautiful, but I don't think is functionally better again than a lot of the steels you can find in those kind of budget points. But Agreed. people for years in the like, let's say maybe even just 150 to like 500 bucks loosely <laughs> somewhere in there people have been demanding better and better steals and yeah, sure. their money talks because the ones that have the better steals i think from what i perceive tend to sell a little faster tend to have a little bit better um uh, reviews behind them people seem to talk about them more positively and when knives are in a certain price point like that 150 dollars knife i bought yesterday that happens to have 440c on it that's it a talking feels risky, point of, doesn't it? it's a negative thing for for yeah. anyone who looks at that to be like oh it's just in 440c and so i i think yeah it's just interesting how different markets have or different parts segments of the market have demanded certain features and uh, the makers seem to provide that because they want to do what the consumers want. Um, yes. And when you have a, a guy who's producing 900 or thousand dollar knives, like let's look at Brian Brown. Mm -hmm. um, he is making, <laughs> he is making incredible knives right now. A uh, Berg blades. You could jump weir knives. These mm -hmm. are excellent knives and they're using better and better materials. And when those are out there and they're increasing in price on the secondary market, but let's compare that to somebody using not a terrible steel RWL, mm -hmm. but, but, and I think you know where I'm going to go with it, but um, look at what's going on. And I don't want to mention anybody by name, right? But the dolphin knife. Okay. <laughs> um, it's tough because now you're going to buy RWL and prices are coming down on those. And what you bought new for 950 is really hard to sell for more than 700 right now. Mm -hmm. And those prices are continuing to come down. Well, here's the deal. If you're going to play in the big knife market, you have to be able to sell that and get some of your money out. Yeah. You maybe you take a bath of a hundred bucks as a renter's fee to own this knife for a year or two. Mm -hmm. But when other people are making more than what they bought it for, and your knife is deteriorating because of the steel quality. At some point, you have to go, this is lovely. I'll handle it at a nice show, but I don't really want to sink a ton of money into it. Right. And, it, you know, just like Grimsmo. And I just think that he, he produces this beautiful, and I love his story. I love him as a maker. I think he makes an incredible knife. The Grimsmo Norseman is a wonderful knife to own. There are many reasons to own it. But on a, on a pure trader level right now, you are having, you are sweating about getting your money back out of those things right now mm -hmm. because they're coming in, you know, at 900 to 1100 bucks and the secondary market is not supporting that because they're starting to feel like there's competitive pressure from other great makers, like guys like Weir and Brown and Berg who are just absolutely out there killing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think, uh, yeah, the lucky thing for us as consumers is that <laughs> that's a, it can be a good thing for us unless you happen to be the one who paid table and a knife goes low. But at least personally for me, I keep a pretty close eye on values. And as yes. I'm researching a product, I try to figure out just like I would do with a car, right? Like, where can I buy this that it's low in its value cycle so that even yes. if I sell it, I can at least break even. <laughs> Or yes. best case, I, I gain a little bit, uh, not saying I'm a scalper or anything like that, but buying low and being able to at least retain the value ha you have in something feels very good as a consumer. Um, so some of that is just like, if I'm going to buy a Norseman, I'm going to buy it secondary because I know that there are plenty of them on the market. I could find a configuration that I like, and I've just let someone else take that hit for me. You know, it's, that's worth it to me compared to being able to get one brand new from their shop. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So I think uh, now that we've kind of gone down this rabbit hole a little bit, we've painted, I think a pretty clear picture of how you and I perceive value in knives, what we think uh, should be expected at certain value ranges. I think we should start getting into a little bit of the specifics on Chris Reeve knives <laughs> um, and where we think, some of the perceptions may be a little bit off. Um, I'll start by saying, so today with my buddy, Nick, we were talking about how 
or I guess I was talking <laughs> to be fair. I was saying that I think it's interesting how most of the knife companies, both in the U S and abroad have been heavily focused for a while, as long as I've been actively following the community, which is a good few years now, it seems that there's a, a surge to try to innovate, right? There's a, an energy behind trying to make sure that you're ahead of the curve, whether it's with the steel choices, whether it's with certain features that have become almost unanimously accepted as being good and, and proper and should exist on the knife. And so, um, it, I think a lot of the time <laughs> there's a couple of competitors perceived for Chris Reeve knives that are like the main competitors. And we'll probably talk about the, the field of competitors that I think should also be part of the discussion. Um, but if you look at the, the big three, as they're always called, it's the CRK Sabenza, it's the Hinderer XM18, and it's the Strider SNG. Now, I have a Strider SNG. And this is the original three horsemen of the quality knife movement in right. America. And so this knife, I don't think has improved either to be fair. <laughs> I don't think that at Strider knives, they're doing anything to really innovate. Um, all that I see with like following them on social media, the people over there, I see a lot of really crazy finishes and like gnarly grinds to make their knives unique, but it's still the same basic formula that it has been for a long time. Hinderer, on the other hand, if you've been following them for the last couple of years, has made a number of advancements. And some of them have been really well received, others have not, but Hinderer is trying, okay? They're doing stainless steel lock bar inserts. They're doing over travel stops, which I think they've been doing that for a long time, but that's something you don't find on the CRK. You do that one on the, on the SNG, but um, they have updated their pivot system so now yeah, not only, pivot. yeah, they don't even just offer it with bearings now, but they offer it. So it comes with three different setups, including bearings and washers and then Teflon washers. Nice. Um, they've also created new models over time that feel very different from their longtime models, like the half track and the full track. And whether you love those or not, they feel to me more different than any of the other models that Strider makes other than the SNG mm -hmm. to the SNG. Nice or that Chris Reeve makes compared to the, the Sabenza, whatever we're talking about here. <laughs> um, so I think mm -hmm. from just looking at those three, I would say you see the most innovation and effort to give the market what it's asking for from hinderer knives. Would you say that's a fair statement to make? I would agree with that completely. And do you have much experience with hinderers on your end? Absolutely, yeah. I have one sitting in front of me here. I, now, I have owned a few in the past, and uh, there were things I liked and I did not like about them. But I recently have liked a lot more the Eclipse, and I like seeing the Bowie come out in 20 CV, so I have one of those as well. Yeah. Awesome. So I've done a week-long carry challenge with the XM18, much like I did with the CRK. But I didn't use that hinderer as hard because it wasn't the the person who loaned it to me wasn't as comfortable with me using it hard um right. but i have handled quite a few hinderers the only one i've actually owned personally was the i forget what it's called it's like a double-edged dagger blade oh um, wow okay anyway i'm not it, familiar with it interesting knife i feel like kershaw makes it and they well kershaw also makes one is what i'm trying to say and they call it like the maximus or something Maybe that's what Hinderer calls it. Anyway, I had one of those. Oh, I have heard. Yep. Yeah, wasn't a big fan. But um, in general, the XM18 that I did spend a week with carrying and, and trying out a little bit, I liked that one more. I also find like they do really cool blade shapes over there. And so I'm hoping soon to get one of the all battle black, like every component black Bowies yes. of the XM18 with the triway. Yeah. I think that would be sweet. They do, they do cool, interesting things. Um, and obviously there's, there's competing mentalities on which one is higher quality, right? Because of some of the, the things that people perceive to be quality about Chris Reeve knives. But what would you say would be, or would you say there's an argument based on, we can both agree that Hinderer is using more advanced materials 
they're including more advanced technologies, they're offering more models. Is there something that you could say makes Chris Reeve in terms of how we've painted value <laughs> to be comparable at that point? Yeah, so, I mean, great question. I mean, this is where it starts getting really tough, Jake, because first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge three different categories that listeners may be using to categorize. Like if they're doing a taxonomy on, am I allowed to like this knife? Mm -hmm. Number one is this thing is made entirely, every single part is sourced from and came from the United States, US mm -hmm. of A, and this is our freedom fries category, and it's a proud category. And then you have designed and collaborated by United States makers. So the, the driving force behind it was either a US owned company or a designer who might participate with overseas collaborations or partners, but for the most part, it has an American soul. And then you have just the, the best knife that you can find anywhere in the world. And I think it's important to realize that, that those are out there. And when you're talking about Hinder and Strider, in CRK, I think we're looking at kind of USA made knives. US. And we'll get more broad after this for sure. Yep. And when you go USA made knives, it, it's a little bit tougher because you do have to pay more to get the same features. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay to, to consider a, you know, let's call it a patriotic premium on a knife. And you, you just, you're willing to pay that extra. But to me, Chris Reeve Knives is at the bottom of that position. And it's not that they always have been. I think Chris Reeve Knives did some really innovative things in their history. And I think they showed what was possible in knife making in, 19, in the 1990s, mm -hmm. maybe even the early 2000s. But in the year 2021, there's just some things that honestly, just feature for feature, do not line up against those competitors. For example, why on earth do I have to pay a model? I have a Sebenza in front of me right now that I really like. It has all new thumb studs put in it. Mm -hmm. Why on earth do they put horrible thumb studs into the Sebenza and the Incozy? And specifically that one-sided thumb stud that you can't even really get your finger into? Um, it, it makes absolutely no sense to me. And I understand if someone's going, oh, that's a thumb stud. Actually, that's the point. We're literally talking in machining about a 30 cent part mm -hmm. for somebody. Make it out of titanium and it, it might be a buck, okay? And the fact that it doesn't come with usable thumb studs to begin with is just very hard when you hold it up against Hinderer or you hold it up against Strider, which have workable deployment methods mm -hmm. already. So, yeah, I mean, that's what's hard when we look at it. There are some things that I love about what Chris Reeve Knives is doing. They're in single blade shape is a great use of technology where it, it stays extra slicey for years worth of sharpening on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, the way that it, it kind of locks down on the pivot before it's even tightened, that it has that level of attention to detail. To be fair, Strider does, or um, Hinderer does the exact same thing. Yeah, You get your Hinderer pivot halfway in and then there's no blade play at that point. So it, you know, the things that Chris Reeve Knight does well, the problem is, is it doesn't really do it uniquely well. Right. Um, everyone else that it's up against on the American side kind of does the same thing. The only thing that you could say is very unique to them is the in single blade shape, which I do legitimately love, mm -hmm. and it's aesthetics. You know, it has its own aesthetic profile that's very different than the others. And I can see why people might prefer the elegant lines of a Sebenza over, you know, a hinderer, which is very thick and very heavy. and looks like you're going to breach a, you know, a, you're going to go into a bad neighborhood and breach a door with it is what it looks like. So they are, they're three very different knives. If you look, SNG, XM18, and Sebenza, they are design and probably even use case like they're definitely different knives but i feel like for me what it boils down to this sng that's sitting in front of me is a, this is a rare case where it's worth more after so that's a, a different thing but this is worth more than it was brand new which is cool for me because i'm gonna sell it but um 
th that knife doesn't feel to me more. Uh, I like it better than a Sabenza, but it doesn't feel better made or like the technology in it is better. The tolerances are probably even maybe a little worse, but like, I like the design better for sure. And for my hand, it fits better. And for the way I use a knife in this category, I like it better. But what I find most interesting is like the XM18, even though it's not my favorite knife out there, I don't even own one right now. <laughs> like I, I, they're, it's not, I own knives more expensive than the XM18. I could own one already, but I don't. If a perfect one comes along, if I can get that all blacked out, Bowie one, then like I'll probably pull the trigger on that because I think that would be cool. But even then, I don't know if it'll be a forever knife for me. That said, I just feel like in terms of materials being offered, and in terms of even customization options, sure, oh, at Hinderer, point. they're stupid expensive at Hinderer. To be able to get a scale for like $100 for a single side scale is stupid to me. I think that is a case of overcharging. And they really don't like it from what I hear for you to use non -after, or to use aftermarket parts on there um, from third parties, right? But okay. considering that you can modify it, that it has more options available and that it's using what I consider to be objectively a better blade steel to have better technology built into how it locks up, how it deploys. It comes with more options of deployment. You can switch it out. If you're team washers, go for it. If you're team bearings, go for it. Like I think yeah. that's, that's advancement and that's to me makes a better value proposition, even just for hinderer, like, as a company that they're spending time on R and D and that they're figuring out these things that as like, it, in my mind's eye, what makes a good U S company is stuff like that. And we, that's still just talking to big three. There are other U S companies we can talk about here that are all U S labor using U S materials. They're doing these things that are supposedly what makes it so valuable that Chris Reeve knives is just USA, USA, USA. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Like ProTech, by the way, which in their button locks is, I think that the ProTec button lock knives are every bit as elegant and infinitely better than at their price point, right? The Mordax at $225 than anything that honestly, Hinder or CRK is putting out right now. Mm -hmm. We had no disrespect to those two. It's just they're doing it 225 with a level of sophistication as an American company with an American workforce and American parts. Yep. I absolutely agree. And ProTech is one of my favorite brands and I think is one of the best examples of a U.S. company. Now, what I think is interesting about ProTech and some of these others we can talk about is they don't make a knife right now that I think kind of directly competes with the Sabenza. I already, I don't think <laughs> that much that the XM18 and the SNG should be super comparable or looked at as being such. Yeah, they lack the elegance. Yeah, they're, they're a different knife, but even considering that ProTech just doesn't even really offer a, a typical like catalog knife that's not customized or in some weird version that costs as much as a Sabenza does. And even then, sure, you're getting aluminum instead of titanium in most cases, um, but you get oftentimes on their most recent knives that they're coming out with, listening to the market, improving their blade steels, you're getting 20 CV, which I think is... A, again, <laughs> objectively, I think is better than S35 VN in terms of measurable performance. Um, you're getting an action that I find way more satisfying. You're getting tight tolerances. You're getting a phenomenal warranty, which a lot of people yes. talk about for Chris Reeve knives. So yeah, ProTech is a perfect example of a company. If you're buying a company and not just looking at the knife as an object, but the company, because so many people say this about Chris Reeve knives, it's about the company. I would rather buy from ProTech, who I think is, they have energy behind them to innovate and to bring me the things that I find important in a knife and to find ways to bring that to market and to make it affordable. And they're like, they're working on that actively and doing R and D and creating their button locks are different from any other button lock that existed previous to them existing. They're better. They've, they've made yes. that advancement. Yeah. And let me add one thing to that too. I, I do think that there's an aspirational nature to Chris Reeves marketing, for example, the way that he says, when you look at his documentary work and he says, I'm trying to make the finest thing that's ever existed. And that's fine if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And then they'll talk about how, you know, they, they machine the titanium scales so perfectly true flat that, you know, no 
So, I mean, this thing literally is so clean cornered that it can run for office in Arkansas. There is no curve in it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And the machines that it takes to produce this are very expensive, which add to the cost of the knife. Sure. Understood. And I think as an object of desire, if you want something that's that perfectly straight, then I think we're now we're talking about rarity and now it might be worth it to pay for it. Just like having a hand carved, uh, a lamb, a candle from a, you know, a Russian artist. Mm -hmm. However, I do not believe that humans can feel the difference. In fact, I know for a fact that the research says that we cannot feel the difference in microns and, you know, hundred thousandths of an inch in truing. And so to me, that is not real value that's being put into a knife. It's not, there's a level of diminishing returns. And I think that in the 1990s, there were a lot of very poorly made knives on the market compared to what you get production wise today. But today from these other manufacturers, I don't know anyone that's going to pick up, you know, something from Birch Tree Blades or something from Protec or something from Hinder or Strider and go, you know, this scale feels like it is 200 thousandths of a micron out of true. Does it you feel this? Like Terry? Yeah, yeah, Terry, grab this. Does this feel like, can you feel that? And Terry's going to go, oh, well, you, man, you better send this thing back. You need to get your money back. I just don't know any real human that's going to have that conversation. Right. Plus, I think with modern machining, I, I don't think – I'm not an expert. I haven't really done research on this. But I'd be willing to bet there are companies other than Chris Reeve Knives who are getting their knives just as flat with modern CNC technology and setups and, and with how, how much – that industry has progressed even outside of knife making modern cnc is remarkable when somebody's really good at it and so uh, like is grimsmo not achieving as flat of a surface as crk is yeah and certainly as fine as any human can detect and, and i will say in my i you know one of the benefits that i've had working on this little knife project for me with instagram is that i've gotten to interview a lot of different makers and manufacturers mm -hmm. and and to get them to just talk freely off the record and help me learn. And I have loved that. I'm nothing, I have nothing but gratitude for the curiosity I've been able to show and the time that people have taken with me. And one thing that I have learned is that tolerances do matter because it's like compound interest. You know, as humans, we do not understand compound interest very well. We just don't. It's a bias that we have. Right. And we don't understand how tolerances compound in a knife. So you're out of true on one micron on the pivot joint and then another couple microns and then a couple thousands of an inch on this part. And then what happens is you assemble it in, in a shop in California that's at 60 degrees annually with, you know, 25% humidity and the knife is perfect. And you ship it to Alaska where it is, you know, much drier or maybe much more humid and it's much colder. And all of a sudden, all of those little tolerances add up and you know it doesn't open as easily or mm -hmm. it has a little bit of lock stick and then you ship it back to the manufacturer and it gets back in its assembled climate and the thing works perfectly and all of a sudden the guy at the shop's going there's nothing wrong with this knife and the guy in alaska is going well this these guys are just crap so mm -hmm. yeah i mean there is kind of a of a magical level where being out of tolerance or just even tiny variations in acceptable tolerance can lead to to different knife behaviors. So if we buy three copies of the same Chavez knife assembled at the same time in the same place, they might all be slightly different mm -hmm. in how they open and how they function. But I think the, the big point here is so heard, we hear you, Chris Reeve Knives, that, that your obsession with tolerance has an object to it and we hear you. But I think if you look at their competitors who are also obsessed with those things, but they just don't market it as, as upfront, Mm -hmm. that you see the same basic variances and you're not getting bad copies going out one after the, in fact, if anything, I, my, my hinderers that I have held, I've never had one out of the box that made me go, why did you even ship this thing? Right. And I have had two different Chris Reeve knives that I had to put custom work into to get them usable. So here's my question to follow up on that. Would you yeah. say that the tolerances from Chris Reeve knives are actually the best in the business or are they a talking point that's been going on since they were the best in the business, but they no longer are? Cause I think it's the latter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously that, that's a, that's a loaded question, but I think it's a very fair and authentic question. And I agree. I, I have seen nothing out of Chris Reeve knives to tell me that they are the best tolerances in the business. 
Right. Now, if you pull out a micrometer, might it be true? Maybe, but not in the ways that human perceive. And in fact, I will go one step beyond that and say the umnumzon that I had I, and, and expected that that would be my, that was my Goldilocks Chris Reeve knife mm -hmm. was so bad. Well, that's the thing. It, I know plenty it was of people. so bad. Plenty of people who've cited their own personal experiences, which sure is anecdotal. And so it's it's worth whatever it's worth. But I think a lot of the talking points that I'll, I'll go over that people say about Chris Reeve knives is also anecdotal. Anyways, I've had a, a number of people tell me that the action or something about their Chris Reeve knife wasn't perfect. It's, it's rare that I hear like there's a big issue with this knife, right? That's rare. Mm -hmm. And even on their site, it'll say like on the rare case that there's an issue, we want to take care of it. No one is perfect <laughs> at machining mm -hmm. anything, right? There's still a human element happening there. That's going to happen. But I know too many people who've gotten some that aren't perfect for them to be like our, our it's own a pattern. Our, our big thing is tolerances because I just don't see it. You know, like when I think tolerances in my collection, I think Koenig Arius, the Koenig Arius. Yes is also made in Idaho in very small numbers by a, a small team of Americans using U.S. materials other than the M390, I suppose. But they're uh -huh. good people making good knives here in the U.S. And they're even really big. If you follow Bill Koenig, he's huge on like buy everything U.S. that's possible. Like he will buy U.S. made shoes and he'll make sure before he buys a new pair of shoes that they were actually made in the U.S. He'll make sure that the washing machine he buys from his house or for his house was made in the u.s like he's that gung-ho about it and so yes. to me if it's like the patriotic plea that box is checked here right and this knife to me tolerance wise feels yes. every bit as crisp i would argue a lot more than any crk mm -hmm. i've ever handled and i think there's an element of they're not making nearly as many so maybe they can put a little bit more attention maybe in in the hand assembling they're also hand tuning a little bit more but to me, that's more valuable than, like you said, those those microns that I can't perceive. Like this knife is put together, in my opinion, <laughs> better than any Chris Reeve knife I've ever held or seen. It's just, it is perfect in terms of centering, in terms of action, in terms of lockup. Every feature of this knife is dialed. Now again, Koenig could every now and then send out a knife that isn't dialed perfect. It could happen. But I hear it's not them. a pattern for them. I, I, I mean, agree. There is a pattern too. of bad tolerance coming out of Chris Reeve knife shop, right. and it, it's just true. And I will say this: you know, the the Sebenza that I have now, I love. It is beautiful. You can middle finger flick it, and but here's the deal: it took hours and hours of work and about two hundred dollars of mods. I got this one up from Chris at Renegade EDC, mm -hmm. and this is a man who abuses his knives. I mean, when he, I do a lot of knife trades with him. And I love used knives. I love patina. I like blade scratches. I am weird like that. Mm -hmm. But he sends his in a wood coffin with pennies on its eyes because they come in beat up. And he took hours and hours on this one of working, of polishing the washers and working them down all the way down to, you know, millimeter uh, lapping compounds. And I took out and did the same thing. And I, I've worked with it. He sent this off to Razor Ramon and had two good thumb studs put in it. Mm -hmm. He had the finish actually tightened up a little bit so that it doesn't scratch as easy. Mm -hmm. um, and this Sabenza, I would put on par with a Koenig Arius. Uh, it's a different knife, and I can see why somebody would prefer the Koenig over this one. Mm -hmm. But it is a functional knife in the same way. This thing new was $550. It required an extra $200 put into it and numbers of hours polishing the washers. And that same process could have caused the blade to true to one side or the other if you over polish a washer or to introduce blade place we, we kind of had to put it at risk to do it mm -hmm. and to me that's just the that's the perfect way to look at it is there's a pattern of knives coming out that are just not as functional as they should be from chris reeve knives yeah and which there are has, also which beautiful one copies the, which one has the voided warranty now too <laughs> you know, like, yes oh and the chris reeve is completely voided in its warranty now the koenig is completely exactly as it came out of the box and it is yes. if i need anything from them i send it to them <laughs> like that's yes. the way it works so chris reeve knives one of the main talking points is tolerances as we've spoken about we've kind of gotten away from competitors but i think that's good we'll come back to it i kind of want to go through 
I, uh, in a rare case for me, I wrote down a list, but I went through some of the comment sections of videos that I did on that Sabenza saga, and I looked for common themes of people who were maybe a little upset <laughs> about the outcome of me being negative about the knife. And I have also just kind of like brainstormed a little bit of just the things that I can recall being told a lot in defense of Chris Reeve knives as for why the people who've bought them or who love them or who have a million of them, the people who are fans of Chris Reeve knives say these things very often as defenses of why it is worth the money and why it's the best, right? Some people yeah. might not claim it's the best, but why it's their favorite or whatever right. it is. These are the, the defenses I hear of it. So I think let's just kind of go through them one at a time and then Brilliant. maybe take a moment to talk about those things. And then we'll see how many of these are unique only to Chris Reeve knives as well, or whether these can be found elsewhere. So the first one that I wrote down is warranty. That's probably the number one thing that people say to me about Chris Reeve knives, maybe behind USA, 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 which is, I'm a patriotic guy. I prefer to buy a US. I feel like we've already talked enough about that. And we'll talk about it some more when we go over competitors in other countries. But in terms of warranty, would you say, that Chris Reeve knives is alone in having a good warranty. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, you know, Chavez, for example, has a great warranty. Hinder does great with their warranty. Um, Olamic, I know that they're not 100% produced in the United States. They, they participate overseas for some of their machining, but mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, worked on by United States artists, incredible warranty. Um, I have, in, in fact, I would even say, that Chris Reeve knife has a good enough warranty to be in that price category, for sure. They, there's no dunce cap on them there. Um, they have done just enough. But if you do some research, you'll even find some controversies in there. You know, them shipping knives back to people disassembled in parts. You know, there was the there was the you know Chris Reeve himself was a little bit of a pugnacious character in the knife world, and he would he would often get mispats at at knife shows and you know you can even if if a dear listener wants to go look it up find out that at times he has gone on the record and said things like my knives weren't meant to be flicked open and if if you go flicking them too hard that may void your warranty in practice do i think they're shipping back knives that have been flicked open no i don't but just that drawing that line right there and having that kind of controversy to me says good enough to be in the category but in no way is it somehow the benchmark mm -hmm. for what's going on so i think it's a good this is a good jumping off point too to the next category because i think what a pe people conflate a lot is warranty and spa service i i hear a lot yes. of people using the word warranty when i think what they mean is spa service because then they'll follow up with like and and if it ever even gets like uh, if you need it refinished or sharpened you just send it into them they take care of it that's spa service. That's not warranty. Those are two different things. So I think that when I look through Chris Reeves' site, I don't have it up in front of me anymore, but the warranty section to me seemed like a good warranty. <laughs> I don't, right. I don't think there's anything about it that makes their warranty better than pretty much any other U S company, regardless of the category they're in. Like Benchmade has a pretty good warranty. There was a comment on one of my videos that I specifically read. It was very long. And it was this guy who was like, Chris Reef has the best warranty. One time I had an issue and they replied back to me within two days. And then on my Benchmade knife, I sent them an email. It took them four weeks to respond to me and then six weeks to get the washer to me. And it's like, okay, first of all, that's very anecdotal. That's one person's experience. I don't know who you emailed at Benchmade, how they handled it. Sure, it could likely have happened, but I've never had a warranty experience with Benchmade. However, I have called customer service because I've needed something very simple like a clip or a set of screws, which they used to give for free. Now they'll sell it to you. That's a whole other conversation, but they've always been very pleasant with me. And as I've looked at their warranty before, it, it seems and to they me sharpen like, for free as well. Yeah, they, always they have them. life sharp, right? And they also like if, if there's a defect in the knife and it breaks they will fix it or replace it because it was a defect. That's basically what Chris Reeves warranty is from what I perceive. Um, it, and as evidenced by the, like, if you damage this on your own, then it's not warrantied, whether it's by finger flicking or whatnot, like they might help you out 
but it, when I looked on their site, it also said a replacement blade is 150 bucks. So like, that's not free. If your blade fails and it snaps, maybe they'll be cool and they'll bro deal you. But what's in writing is like that it still costs money <laughs> to fix a broken blade. And there's there's a price list. There's a menu for refinishing. A lot of spa services are included. And obviously now we're segueing into spa. I just did what I accuse a ton of people doing, <laughs> conflating the two. But yep. spa services being different, A, Chris Reeve is not the only company to make nice expensive knives and offer spa services for them. I would argue that that's kind of the norm. Whether you have to pay a little bit to do it or whether it's included when you originally purchase your knife, spa services exist. And on their site, the things that are free are basically handle refinishing and sharpening for plain Jane versions of knives. If you have anything other than plain Jane or micarta, it costs to have your handle refinished. Um, and it, if you've got a whole suite of other features, then like nothing about spawing it <laughs> other than maybe sharpening if you have a damascus steel blade or something, but like re-stone washing, re-etching the damascus steel, any of those other things cost money and it's just it's in writing on their site this is the menu this is how much it costs so people i think say like oh lifetime warranty and they lump into their mind with that like and free spa services for life but it's it, there's only certain things that are covered under spa which is great again that's a very it adds value if you buy a plain jane sabenza to know when you inherently snail trail the scale that they've designed to snail trail that they'll re-blast it so you can snail trail it again I get that. Yeah, and, and let me let me add to that real quick because something that I don't know that people realize when they purchase a Chris Reeve knife, when they pay that kind of money for it, is that they use an incredibly delicate process on that bead blast. Chris Reeve knives, hands down, from any high-end knife I have ever owned, will snail trail and show wear marks faster than all. And here's the thing. This is not just me beating them up. I kind of like it. I like snail trails on knives. When a knife doesn't have a snail trail, I'm kind of reluctant to use it, even though I know it's a user. But once it's like your car, but once you get that first scratch in it, oh, then it's on. Then now I'm back to swinging into parking spots and backing up while I'm on the phone. I'm great with that now. Mm -hmm. And so with CRK, I didn't mind the snail trails, but they show up objectively faster on that finish than any other high-end competitor that I know of. And I would even compare them to like what, I think it's Ilya is her name, but Eugene is who I know at Atlantic. And what they're Ilya doing... His dad, I think. There you go. So um, Ilya and, and, and Eugene, Eugene. And, I, and I know Eugene you know, just through talking, right? I've gotten to know him a little bit um, through yeah. chat. And what I would say is, and I know that all their finishes are done here in the States. They do that work. Mm -hmm. And their bead blast is so thick that after months of use, I'm not seeing any snail trails. So, yeah, I mean, and yes, so does Chris Reeve Nive have a spa service to get rid of the snail trails? Yes, and good on them for having it. No criticism from me for doing that. I applaud you, great work. But you have the most delicate bead blast in the industry. Thank God you have it, because if you didn't, people would be livid. Right, and a lot of the time, as I've perceived like for sale posts of used mm -hmm. Chris Reeve Knives, it seems to me that it's basically the standard <laughs> to have your knife sent to spa and brought back before you sell it because yes. otherwise it's going to be snail trailed up. And so like, I just, I just think it's an interesting thing that I've never had a knife in my collection that I've even felt inclined to have sent in for a spa service. My Koenig, which I carry regularly and use regularly and is raw titanium finish is uh, there is like, one minute snail trail. And I remember exactly when it happened. It's because I set it on my desk and another knife like tumbled into it with its pocket clip or something like it's from contact with another knife. This knife doesn't snail trail in my hands during use in my pocket during carry like this finish to me, the way I prefer, I'd rather have it not look all beat up all the time. This is a pretty knife. And so I just think yeah, it's, it's creating a feature out of a flaw, which again, my buddy Jason uh, used that term in his review of his uh, in Kosi. But I, I think by by providing a spa service, it's almost like kind of, of course they do if they use that finish, because otherwise people will be furious that their knife is scuffed up all the time. So I, in, in my opinion, it seems to me like 
more of a, a way to combat the negative uh, feelings that people would have if they had that finish and knew they couldn't get it fixed for free because uh, people are prone to slamming companies for stuff like that. It's like this scratched up immediately. And I, all I did was put it in my jeans pocket and then now I'm hosed and this knife is worth a hundred dollars less than it was before. And like, no, 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 we'll take care of it. We can spa it for you. And it's like, yes. It's and like, I would add, you know, one more point in there, just, you know, in the spirit of helping to, you know, sharpen the designer's mind of some of your listeners, you know, anodization. So here's a great example on the spa service. So not only does Chris Reeve knives provide a spa service, but, but part of that is to bring a balance to the world of having a very delicate bead blast finish, which apparently was very forward looking in the 1990s. They even brag about it in their documentaries. Uh, yeah, we created this process. And I think specifically I've heard them say in some of those and our consumers really loved it. And so why change it? Mm -hmm. um, and what's happening is, is that if I anodize in order to get rid of some of those snail trails, and I put, and I simply put some color into what that little oxide layer on top of the titanium. Mm -hmm. Anodization is not permanent. I can drop it in a rust remover for about seven seconds and take it right back to what it was before. It is a cosmetic change only. It changes nothing about the properties of the titanium. If mm -hmm. I anodize my Chris Reeve knife, according to them, it is now completely out of warranty. Right. They will not honor the warranty on the moving parts because of that anodization. Look at what Eugene is doing at Alamic, for example. And now all of this work is done stateside here. So we're talking an American company. We don't ship it overseas. Eugene has a place on his website and he charges, but it is not a heavy fee. Mm -hmm. And he encourages you, hey, have you scratched this thing up? Have you used it? Do you want it to be a different color? Did you want a lightning anno or a bronze anno instead of this? Did you want to add texture to the scale, which is actually carving into the titanium mm -hmm. to get it? Do you want speed holes put in? What do you want the backspacer reworked? Send it in and let me work on it. These are my knives. I'm proud of them. I'm an artist. And he cranks out the knives. I mean, I'm sure he's not at CRK volume, but he's not, he can't be that far behind mm -hmm. in the big picture. And they will do almost anything cosmetically to your knife for an extremely affordable price. And in fact, they encourage you to. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, right there, if you look at it, to me, that's just a huge contrast between how these two companies think about their products. Oh, you change this cosmetically on the literally the most superficial level that could possibly exist. You are now out of warranty. And Eugene mm -hmm. is saying, send it back to me. I can't wait to freshen it up for you. I want you to love this knife forever. And to be honest, Eugene, what he does with his knives, and I will talk about when we talk about other knife makers, but just to compare it to the Sabenza, right? To the Amnumzom that wouldn't open. Mm -hmm. it, literally, you could hear it scraping as you tried to open it. Um, Eugene has perfected how they tune the detent ramps on these knives to the point where I don't know a single shop that puts out better actions on their knives. The feeling of quality in an, in an Olamic knife. Now you may or may not love the way it looks, the aesthetics of it, and that is fine. Um, that's all beautiful. Well, go get what you love. Mm -hmm. But the action on an Olamic is so good that you open it and you go, oh my God, this is what quality is. And it's apparent to you. Yep. And so anyway, th those are that's a contrast I'd bring between the two that to me just makes the case so clearly about what's going on in the, in the two different perspectives that these knife companies have about how the world should work. Yeah, I think Olamic is one of those examples that we're going to have to kind of dive into because in my reviews of the Olamic Wayfarer, I've specifically cited them as the one that I think is better than any of the big three, personally, <laughs> um, mm, yes. especially CRK, and is in that same price range and has a US entity at least, although they have their parts made in Italy, which is different than having them made in China to people who are just anti-China. Uh, anyways, yep. well, we'll- Their parts yeah. are machined in, in Italy, but assembled, tuned, finished, the, anodized, all in the United States. Yep. And I think a big part of why those knives feel special right out of the box is because someone who cares there at their shop in California is hand assembling it and tuning it to be that yes. good. Um, it feels like it's been worked on by a craftsman who cares about it, which is nice because it also feels really well machined and like the tolerances are nice. You've kind of got both there. Um, speaking of which unintentional segue, the next thing I wrote down is tolerances, which I think we've talked about 
quite a bit. I think we've covered that. Um, but a lot of people say tolerances. And sometimes when I'm joking about Chris Reeve fanboys saying tolerances, I'll write it in that way where it's like capital letter, lowercase letter, capital letter, lowercase letter, because I kind of say it like the SpongeBob meme where he's like leaning over and he's like tolerances. You know, it's just, I don't think that they are special. I, I, I laugh at the idea that Chris Reeve knives has the best tolerances in the industry or that they're unique in having high levels of tolerances. I don't think that's the case. I think anybody who's handled a lot of nice knives can cite a lot of other examples of knives that have really good tolerances <laughs> and it's, they're just not alone there. Um, in that 350, that 250 to 450 kind of tier two sweet spot that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. I think you're hard pressed to find a knife that does not have very impressive tolerances. Mm -hmm. Sure. They're going to be in there, but on pattern, you're going to buy those knives and you're going to go, wow, there's a lot going on here. So absolutely. Now, is, does Chris Reeve knives, do they have great tolerances? Sure. Absolutely. And all credit and applause to them for trying. To me, the problem is saying that they somehow are the benchmark in the industry. That's what I think becomes dishonest. They Not that they don't try hard. In the 1990s, they were absolutely the benchmark. Mm -hmm. In 2021, there's a lot of competitors who are using their time, their energy, and their resources trying to make the best thing that has ever existed, just like just like Chris himself worked at mm -hmm. to do. And I, what I feel is, right, as a college football fan, you can have a legendary coach who it's still time to fire because they lose their edge. And it's really easy to lose your edge when your competition is very, very good and motivated. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, the way I look at it is on some things, Chris Reeve is giving up their edge and they're trying to hide behind their story of themselves. And I do think that they had the edge in the 1990s and the early to mid 2000s. You know, when the Semenza 21 came out, what was that in 2008? I absolutely think they were still on the edge, uh, the cutting edge of what they were doing with some of their blade shape and some of their tolerance work. But in 2021, you have some brilliant people that are investing research and development dollars. They're putting their time and their energy into making exceptional things yeah. and they're succeeding. And that, that to me is the story. The story isn't Chris Reeve Knives sucks because it doesn't. It's but look at all of this energy going into these other products. Yeah. Yeah, 13 years since the 21 came out, if it was 2008. And in those 13 years, there's been a, a lot of innovation, <laughs> a lot, a lot. There's been a golden era of knife making that's happened. Yeah. And I think, you're, I think you're right about like them telling their story as well, because to me, the, the tolerances claim is part of their story. I think that's that's yeah. one of those things that's part of their story. And a few of these may be. So the next one I have on here is action. Do you want to go first? Cause I've got words about their action. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I will just say this. Let me use the Amnum Zon as an example. And I know people who love the Zon mm -hmm. as a knife. I think um, Taylor at Best Damn EDC, he is in love with his Amnum Zon. And for that reason, and him and I have some very similar tastes. I really respect him as a thinker. Mm -hmm. You know, he comes across as kind of a you know, a very likable kind of down home guy who's just talking to you about EDC. No, I, I think he's bright. I think he's bright as hell. And I love the way his brain works. And even he has talked about on his Instagram lives, like, oh, I love this knife, but it just destroys your thumb. Well, wait a minute. Okay. If it's a $150 knife, destroying your thumb is fine. But in today's world, in today's market, there is literally no reason to ship a knife to a consumer that will destroy their body in order to open it. It is ridiculous. This to me is their biggest crime right now because not only do they provide these terrible actions on their knives and I can tune a Sebenza. I do work on Sebenzas for people all the time. I can make them beautiful. It's not hard. It is not hard. It's doable. And that's what people don't know if they're leaning on the brand and they don't have the deep knowledge. But not only do they ship you this terrible action on a knife, but then they kick sand in your face on the beach by giving you one shitty thumb stud to try to open it with. I, I, some, they have to know they're doing this. Well, At to be some fair. point, they do also give you a tube of grease. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and, then, and then they give you grease and they have to know they're doing this. And at some point 
I have started to believe, I don't know if this is true, but I have to try to explain this to myself in some way, that if they make those changes to it, that they're admitting that there was something wrong and that doesn't fit into their story. And so they can't do it. And so instead of staying on the innovative edge and putting in that beautiful entrepreneurial energy that so many great companies are showing right now, they're saying, if we if we change the lock bar on the Omnumzon, we're admitting that it wasn't designed well the first time, and that doesn't fit our story. Our yeah. story is when we jumped from the Sabenza 21 to the 31, we made it so much better. But you know what? People are trying to buy the 21s because the actions and the pivots are holding up better. Yeah. And there's some issues with some of the 31s. That, it, that's fine. Issues happen. I'm not go- taking them to task for that. The point is, though, is that their story isn't this upward trajectory story. They're entrepreneurs like everybody else, and they're trying to solve really complicated problems. The omnums on action, hear me, consumers, if this is on your list as a grail knife, and it is, in every case, as I agree with you, it is beautiful. It feels like a, a, it feels like a solid knife when it's open. It feels like it is not a folding knife. It, the lines on it are gorgeous. It is beautiful, but that the thumb, the way that in opening it is okay when you polish it up. Um, you can slow roll it, but I can get them flickable. But when you go to unlock it, it is going to tear up your thumb because they've left a sharp corner on the lock bar where you have to put pressure on it to close it down. and. My my point to you is only that you can do so much better for five hundred and fifty dollars or four hundred and seventy five dollars if you're getting on the secondary than that right there. That is not designed for humans because humans all have thumbs and and hear me on this one. My thumb is deformed from playing with knives. I have permanent. It, it is not a rounded dome on my thumb anymore. I have thick calluses. I was a guitar player for a lot of years. I have thicker callus on my thumb now than even from guitar playing. This is not a pansy thumb. My thumb is is disfigured. <laughs> and I was angry when I closed it. And I was angry for you guys. I was angry for the people that saved up. And I get to trade a lot of high-end knives and keep them moving. But I was angry for people who save up for it. And this is their one shot to get something really, really, really nice. And they fall in love with the lines on it. And the consumer may not know better when they buy it, but Chris Reeve Knives absolutely knows better than it. And in this case, I mean, come on, shame on you guys. You've made something that is so close to being so good. And yet you do that to your consumers. I don't think that is right. I really don't. Yeah. So first of all, I appreciate that. I, I'm glad it turned into a little bit of a rant because I, I think there was a lot of truth there. <laughs> I think it's as ranty as I get, I promise. I like it. Um, so one of the things that I hear most about the action, the term that people use for it is glassy. Now I think that in my mind's eye, something that's glassy sounds good, right? Like I used to do a lot of wakeboarding and if you wake up early and you uh, at first light, you're on the boat, you're the first one behind it, you get the glassiest water. That's great. I love that smooth. You get out for the glass, right? Like (laughs) I'm all for it. That said on a knife, in my experience, glassy is not what I look for. Uh, I like to fidget with knives. I am unapologetic about that. I use knives harder than some, uh, less hard than others. I, I use my knives realistically in my daily life every day for indoor tasks of opening packages, all that kind of stuff for outdoor tasks while I'm hiking. I use my knives a, a decent bit, but action is still very important to me because I fidget with them even more than I use them. Right. Yes. And the Sabenza, the one that I, uh, did the carry challenge with and the others that I've handled have all been, if that's glassy, I want no part of it (laughs) on knives. It's if you slow roll a Sabenza out, then sure. It's smooth to slow roll. This knife is also just like every other knife. (laughs) Sure. If I slow roll this Demco 8020, Ooh, that's glassy. It's bull crap. 
This is on bearings, and it's way more fun to play with because it has a fun lock. I can play with it multiple ways. It drops mm-hmm. shut. And I had an interesting chat today. I, I think this kind of started because um, on Bob the Knife Junkies podcast, we talked about it a little bit. And I think it stemmed from me saying that I actually prefer bearings to washers in a lot of cases. I like washer knives. I own plenty. I, they're, they're good, right? But when I really analyze what I like most, I prefer bearings. And then Bob was like, but doesn't that kind of conflict with you being a bit of an outdoorsman, right? And I, I've thought about it even more since, but it doesn't. I prefer bearing knives because they're fun to fidget with. What I have never found is that a knife on bearings has been less reliable for me in terms of its uh, efficiency as a cutting tool. Because even if I'm outdoors, I get all kinds of dirt and grime in the bearings of my AD20, I will still be able to open this knife, it will lock, and I will be able to cut with it. It won't fidget like I wanted it to before, but when I get home, I can disassemble it, I can clean it out, I can put it back together, and guess what? It will again. So the idea that I feel like there's been this perception of bearings for the last few years, at least that I've been paying attention to the community, where it's like hard use knives get washers and bearings are for fidgeters who don't hard use their knives. This Demco, I would be willing to wager, would be stand up to much more abuse than a Sabenza would, and it's on bearings. And that pivot is not going to fail. I've yet to have it happen. I have batoned with that knife. I've done hard things with that knife, and it's been great. That said, even if you take bearings out of the equation, I like every other knife that I have on washers infinitely more than I like the, the action on a Sabenzo with washers. It's just I want to be able to deploy my knife with one flick reliably and for it to be easy. I like to be able to shake my knife shut fairly easily. I like those things to exist in my knife action. I want to be able to play with it and have fun doing it. I don't want it to hurt my thumb. I don't want it to be a board open. I'm not a slow roller. And if I was, like I started with, you can slow roll any knife that I own on bearings or washers and it will feel glassy. I just, I feel like that's this term that people use for Chris Reeve knives, which is in my opinion, it's nonsensical. I, a glassy action is meaningless to me at this point because people associate that with a knife that has a lot of tension and doesn't feel gritty, but is still hard to open. What? Like, yeah, I don't I want my knife completely. hard to open. Um, so yeah, action to me is just, it's, it's, it's one of the worst knife actions that I've played with regardless of price point. And uh, it, getting back to the grease thing, the fact that they send this thick grease for your pivot and your oversized washer, however you're supposed to put it in there. Like, I also feel like that's a weird move. I think if that was actually a really good thing, like a lot of people are like, oh, and they include this, this cool grease that you put in there. I think other knife makers would have caught on by now that grease is good for a pivot. And I don't know of anybody else that is using grease as a lubricant for their pivots, washers, bearings, anything. It's just not a thing that people are using. And so I that has me scratching my head. I don't see what the perceived benefit is of using grease in your pivot. It just seems yeah. weird. Oh, Jake, on the on the grease thing, yes. And I do not understand it either because it get, it just gets fouled up. Now, on the, the bearings to washer, it's just the, the brief thing I would say is the only material, the only media that I have found that will clog them closed is drywall. And so when I'm on drywall cutting projects, I have a beater drywall knife. It's a D2 and okay, fair. Other than that, what happens to bearings is that they get gritty and you can blow them out or you can disassemble a knife and have it cleaned within 10 minutes for the most mm-hmm. part. I've never um, had so, one that I couldn't still open at least and get it to lock. It will they still- will always open. They will always open. And for the most part, if you can blow really hard into the back of it, if it's not wet or muddy, Mm-hmm. then you know it it works are washers great for that yes although drywall will still lock a, a washer knife so close it's hard to get open mm-hmm. but here's the thing with the grease the grease collects abrasive material in it mm-hmm. and it grinds it in there and one of the first thing if you want your chris reeve knife to operate properly and i know that they're going to take such offense to this statement 
But as somebody who's tuned up probably 20 of them for different people, the first thing you have to do is get the grease out of there. And you can use some KPL. That works great. Mm -hmm. I played around. One guy had a beater, Sabenza, and he's like, just try whatever you want. This was a few years ago. I used Molly Lube. You know what Molly Lube is? It's like it has molybdenum in it. And you, you heat it up and you put in the molly and you create some friction and it actually bonds to the metal parts. They use them in guns. You can yeah. you can use them on your gun slide. So Because what happens is it dries out and doesn't collect. I got a Sabenza working better on molly lube than on the grease that they sent out. And there was no other oil in it. It's amazing. So I, I don't know why they put that out there. At the very least, I think I would say just don't feel like it's some secret. If you like to use your grease, use your grease. For sure, but don't feel like it's some you know secret that came from the elves that live under the mountain. And if you do, right. and if you don't use the grease and you're hurting your sabenza, you're probably improving it. Or just get some extra virgin olive oil from your stovetop. <laughs> yeah. um, Anything, you, you, super glue at this point would probably sure. collect about the same amount of dander. And it's okay <laughs> that they send it. I appreciate that. I just don't want people to feel like there's a mystique around it because there's really not. Right. Yeah. So I think we can both agree that action from our experience and perception is not a strong suit of the knife. Um, people it's are the weakest I, performer in the action department of all the $350 plus knives that I own. That's a good way to put it. I, I was going to say, I if somebody for some reason likes that, then I am in no position to say that you're not allowed to like a different thing than I like. That's one of those things that I, I struggle even to say that it's like, it's not a, or that it is opinion because to me, it seems objectively bad, but some people may like that. Maybe you want your modern folding knife to open like a slip joint. And the Chris Reeve Sabenza is the closest thing to that for you. Um, it might even feel like it has a half stop if you put enough of that grease in there, but it's just not, it's, it's not modern <laughs> is the way I'll, I'll probably put that. Um, yes, you okay, can so. prefer it. Like some people like burn toast, you can prefer it and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But objectively, if you want to compare it to its competitors, it is not a benchmark of quality. That is true. Perfect. All right. So, the next one, and I feel like we've we've touched on a lot of these. This is one we've touched on maybe a little bit. The next one I have is ease of maintenance. Um, would you say that the Chris Reeve Sabenza has a specific advantage in terms of ease of maintenance compared to other knives? Uh, no. Uh, over some, for sure. It, is it the easiest to pull apart model that I own? No. Is it an easy to pull apart model? Yes, it is. It, it is it, Chris Reeve, not Chris. Reeves knives are easy to service. They are not the easiest, but they are probably in the top five that I have. If we just do number of screws mm -hmm. involved. And how um, easy they are to put back together and everything lines up. I, I'll give them yep, that. Yeah. Yep, they pop out. Yep, but there's not... And I can list some knives that are a lot tougher, but Hinderer is very easy to take apart and put back. In fact, I... Okay, here's the problem that I have. Is Chris Reeve knives easy to maintain? Yes, very few screws, which I like. Mm -hmm. But there's some persnickettiness to it. You do have to lock it in just right. Um, you do have to watch a couple of things. Hinder knives, to me, actually set the standard for ease to pull apart. And they sell official modding stuff, so they know you're pulling this thing apart. Mm -hmm. um, are there more screws on a hinder? Yes. But am I... Have I ever had a hinder go back wonky on me? No. A few times I've had a Sabenza where I thought it was locked in right. It just wasn't. So I had to, to go back. None of it was difficult. Mm -hmm. But I would, to me, hinder would take, would take the maintenance award. Yeah. So I agree with you. I think they are easy to maintain compared to a vast, like a, a ton of other knives on the market. They're definitely easier. What I don't mm -hmm. think is that they're the easiest. And I don't think they're like... I, I would consider a positive, but not necessarily like something that sets them apart as being special in today's day and age of how knives are put together. Even just looking at the knives on the table in front of me, I've got a Vero, I've got a Riat made Vox F5.5, I have the Demco 8020, I've got a ZT 0620, I've got all these knives around and I, I don't feel like any of these would actually be more difficult for me to take apart and put back together. It might take me maybe 
a minute less, a minute more than a Sabenza, but the terms of like uh-huh. difficulty of getting it lined up, getting it back together, getting, I, I don't think I'd, I'd have any issues with them. And maybe some of that is my comfort level of taking knives apart, putting them back together. I've done it a good few times on a, a variety of knives, but like, I just, I don't think that the, the Sabenza or any of the Chris Reeve models have a specific like technological advantage that makes them easier. They just happen to be put together. Well, they do have good tolerances. They do fit together well. They do have a simple construction, but like CRKT does field strip technology now where you just like turn a thing and flip a switch and the knife comes apart. Like that's ease of maintenance if you want to get like nerdy about it. Not that I'm saying I want a CRKT and that I think it's a competitor with a Sabenza, but it. Right. It's but they're, they're pushing the limit. Yeah. I agree. One, and let me tell you one drawback for somebody who's doing it. If you have a lot of knives, you probably have something like a Vero Fulcrum or some kind of tool that you travel with that has T6 and T8 torque mm-hmm. bits in it. And with these bits, I can tighten my pivot. I can pull apart almost every knife I own. With Chris Reeve knives, they actually don't do that. They, they use a special Allen key that they send you. Mm-hmm. And you have to keep track of these things. Now, can you get a T8 Torx into that Allen key slot? Yes. But I have found that if it's not the best head, it will actually strip the head because it's mm-hmm. It's not a one for one alignment on it. And mm-hmm. so if that head's getting a little tired, it will strip them. So in my maintenance kit, I have these, these torques and that handles everything I have, except then now I have these two different sized Allen keys that mm-hmm. I have to put in my maintenance bag and take with me. Now, is that a huge burden? No, it's not. But is it just one more thing that you're going, okay, right? There's, yeah, they're easy to maintain, but you, there still is something to babysit there. That's one of those weird things too, where to the average person who's not in this hobby, an Allen key would be a way easier thing to source and have on hand than a Torx yes. bit. But because in the arena of knives, <laughs> Torx is basically the agreed upon body screw and pivot screw technology, unless you have some proprietary pivot that you don't want people pulling apart or you provide a special tool or something. But like Torx is what's on every knife in front of me, every single one. Uh, it's on every the, knife and the, the universal standard is P8 is the best. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's it. So uh, exhibit a weird pivot, but it's okay. designed to use a normal wrench, <laughs> which is a Got weird, it. weird move from ZT. But yeah, generally it's like Torx bits. That's what uh, my Vero fulcrum, which lives in my fanny pack and has Torx bits in it has a T6 and a T8. And now I even keep the T10 in there and a little Phillips head as well, just like in a, little tiny pouch thing that keeps them protected. Yep. Um, and like now I can service any of my knives, but I couldn't reasonably with a Chris Reeve unless I had that there. So it's a fair point. Um, but ease of maintenance, not a negative. We're like, not a negative. I don't think any of these things necessarily other than action have been a negative. Like warranty is fine. Spa is fine. Tolerances are fine. Action was, um, and then ease of maintenance. Fine. Yep. Can, can we agree on that? Okay. Yep. Um, the next thing I have, we've definitely already gone over, but I just put quality in quotation marks. Um, and we've talked about quality. We'll probably circle back around to that. The next thing I have listed is that it'll last you a lifetime. And I hear this a lot. Like it's an heirloom piece. It's got the lifetime warranty. It's something that will outlive you. You can hand down to your children. How do we feel about <laughs> the, the claims that this is the knife that will last you a lifetime? Okay, so I'll be quick on this one. Um, Two things come to mind. One is, yes, is this a heritage quality piece? Yes, in all respects, but one. Um, What is not heritage quality is the steel choice. Mm -hmm. Chris Reeve Knives is in love with using the steel that was cutting edge in the 1990s, and it's S30V. S30V in today's world is your S35, you're right. But to be honest, it's all just about the same. The S35 class of steel um, is a perfectly acceptable tool steel base. I don't like it as a worker. What I do like is that it is basically corrosion resistant. As long as you're willing to wipe it down and do some maintenance, it's not really gonna rust up on you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. To me, it's the bare minimum. But here's the problem. $100 Hundred to hundred and fifty dollar knives are using S thirty five V in steel. Even sub hundred dollar ones regularly at this point. 
at this point. And the, the, there's not only is the steel not inspiring, that's one way we could go, but I don't even want to go there. When you're using a knife, and I hard use my knives, I have to resharpen specifically the Sabenza because of that in single blade shape that's so slicey. And I love it. It's a beautiful shape. I think it's a great innovation that CRK does. Um, but I have to resharpen this thing after every hard use in order to keep it really razor sharp. Right. And the more I sh yeah, and the more I sharpen it, the more risk I run of like grinding into the handle. I mean, there's all these things that happen when you when you sharpen a knife because you are removing material. And it, you know, I fold the edges on it a lot. The edges collapse on me quite a bit. It I don't think that the blade is a lifetime blade. That's not S30V is not heritage quality steel. It, not really. Now, like your grandpa's old buck knife, you know, can it make its way 60 years into the future? Oh. I don't know if you can hear me, Will, but or <laughs> I can't, I'm not sure if you can hear me, MB, but your audio cut out there for a second. Um, hopefully that comes back. To piggyback off of that, in case we're gone for a few minutes, um, the next category actually was S35VN because there are a lot of people that talk about S35VN. It is a talking point of the knife. And I have a couple of uh, like subcategories within S35VN in terms of what I've, I've observed people saying about it. One is that Chris Reeve was part of the invention of S35VN. He's part of the reason that it exists. He was involved in that process of creating the steel. Cool. Um, the other thing that people say about it is that it's easy to sharpen. I've even heard people say like it's something that even if you need to sharpen out in the field, you can. Okay. Um, and then I've heard more than a few people claim that Chris Reeve there at CRK is able to do the, the best possible heat treat on S35VN. And I've even seen it inferred that they have some kind of secret sauce, like that their way of using S35VN is unmatched by any other knife that has S35VN on it because they've perfected the heat treat on the steel. Now, where I have a little bit of a, a where I take issue with that is good heat treat is good heat treat. <laughs> I, I've listened to a, a few people uh, one of my favorites being Alex Steingraber, who's nerdy about steel. He makes fantastic custom fixed blade knives, and he's just a, a really cool dude in the way he approaches it, I think. And he's always talking about heat treat and the process, and I, I like the way his brain works on the subject. Now, when he talks about specifically the way that heat treats are a formula, it resonates with me. And I've heard him talk about the fact that it, it's either good or it's not <laughs> like there can be some variance in terms of what your like HRC number is. And the, you can use specific processes to get the most out of steels, but nobody has like this secret ability to stretch the steel further than its actual limits. It has to peak out at a certain point. And uh, although I, I have no problem admitting or maybe conceding that S35VN from Chris Reeve is probably very good S35VN. I haven't used it enough personally to really see the difference. What I can say with confidence is that other companies are also equally good in using S35VN. There are other companies who will treat it just as well as they will at CRK. But no difference. Maybe even for the way certain people use it, better. Maybe at CRK, they run it a little bit softer than they could run it because they want you to be able... Sorry, Will, you're back. I'm just finishing up a thought here. So even if at Chris Reeve, as I was saying, sorry, this keeps getting interrupted. Um, I, there's, there's just no way that Chris Reeve is making it magical. Their S35VN is as good, no better, than anybody else who's getting the most out of S35VN. It's possible that they're running it a little bit harder or a little bit softer based on their preferences and what they want to get out of the steel. Sure. Um, if they run it a little bit softer so that maybe it's tougher, a little easier to sharpen, it will have less edge retention. It's all, if they run it too hard, it would be 
other issues. Like it, it, there's a range that they can operate in. I believe on their site, it says they take it to 59 to 60 HRC, which for S35 VN seems about right based on what I've seen other people do. But I don't believe that there's anything magical happening. It's still the same chemical composition and they're heat treating it well. So when other knife companies use S35 VN and they get it right, then it's also right. Chris Reeve is not the only one who's capable of it. Whether Chris Reeve was in, integral in creating the steel or not. So, which is another thing. The fact that he was involved in the process of creating the steel, to me, doesn't make it more valuable that they still use it. I think uh, there may be some sort of that going on. And to be fair, it sounds like they're switching over to S45VN. I'm not sure if that's already begun happening or if it's going to begin happening soon. But S45VN, from what I've seen on the charts and the data, still to me seems relatively underwhelming. I don't think it's a big enough leap forward after all this time of being behind to really catch up. And I think when I looked on their site, it says that they were involved in the creation of S45 VN as well, which is interesting to me because Chris Reeve hasn't been at Chris Reeve Knives for a long time. So I, I don't know who, I, I don't doubt that the company, Chris Reeve Knives, was in some way involved with the development of S45 VN. I don't have any reason to say that that could be wrong, but it's like, was it Chris Reeve who helped create S35 VN or was the company of Chris Reeve Knives somehow involved there? How does it all come together? I don't know, and I don't really care whether they helped create it. Like, there are a number of companies that I'm aware of, at least one that I can think of off the top of my head, who recently have developed a knife steel that they plan to use. I can think of two. So Spyderco with Spy27, they've created their own kind of in-house steel. It's comparable to a number of others. It's not meant to be an insane, like, pushing the envelope super steel. It's meant to be something that they can put as kind of their new mid-range like baseline steel, I think. And that's fine. I can also think of artisan knives with their AR RPM 9. That steel is something that they helped create. Neither of those steels are special to me because Spyderco developed them or because artisan developed them. It does not make a difference to me. And so the idea that S35VN is better because Chris Reeve or his company or whoever, or S45 VN is better because these people were involved in helping develop it. I don't care <laughs> in terms of the, the data of how good the steel really is. It makes no difference who's, who was standing in the building or who was putting their minds together with the people who make the steel. Like it's either objectively better or it's not. And when I read steel charts, granted, Different people look for different things in steel. Different people have different priorities in steel. For some people, it's all about how easy it is to sharpen. Great. Get something really low end because it'll be very easy to sharpen. Uh, for some people, it's about how long it holds an edge. For me, that's important on a lot of knives. For other people, it's about how tough it is. For me, that's important on certain knives. For others, it's how corrosion resistant it is. For me, again, that's important on certain knives. I have knives in kind of each of those categories, and I like that. And when I want a steel that's really tough, I want to pick a knife that comes in one of the steels that is toughest. When I want a steel that has really good edge retention, I want to pick one of the knives that comes in a steel that has really good edge retention. If I want corrosion resistance, I want to pick a knife that has really good corrosion resistance. And so to me, the idea of S35VN being talked about as if it's the most balanced and it's a great compromise of being easy to sharpen. And easy to sharpen to me means doesn't hold an edge. I'd prefer hold an edge over easy to sharpen. And then the, the idea that it's like magical and it's heat treat and it's so balanced and all these things come together. And to me, they're meaningless. <laughs> they just don't make me excited about S35VN. All of that said, I like objectively S35VN. I think it is a steel that I'm fine with existing. I have I've owned, and I think I do own, several knives in S35VN that have served me well. They've been good knives. I've had it from multiple manufacturers. I've never found that um, any of them have done a poor job with their S35VN in my use. And so it just, it to me, it's not a value proposition. It doesn't add to the value 
to say that it's S35VN or now S45VN. It's just become this talking point where the only people who seem to be defending it say these things like, well, their S35VN is different. They really heat treat it well there. Or, well, of course they use it because he invented it for this knife model. And so it, it has to be on this knife model. That's the way it was designed to be. There are several steels. I'll say several to be conservative. I, I think there are many, but there are several steels to be conservative that are better at just about every metric of performance other than maybe ease of sharpening. <laughs> they can have all three, more corrosion resistance, more edge retention, and be tougher. Maybe not quite all three, but I, I think you could achieve a better balance that has better performance and would add value to the knife and make it more worth its price tag. That's the way I kind of come down on it. MB, are you back? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I could hear you just fine. The mic was just acting up, but I agree with you completely. The only one thing I would add to it is Chris Reeve knives sharpens for free, just like Benchmade. So if they used a steel that was harder to sharpen, the people who had trouble sharpening at home would still just send it back to them for proper sharpening anyway. So that it, their logic doesn't fit on the argument. True. Yeah, that's a, that's a point. that, And maybe that's why they are hesitant to switch. They don't want people sending in a bunch of knives and S90 that they have to resharpen because it'll be harder than sharpening S35VN. Or <laughs> I don't know. Indeed. Um, so I piggybacked off of your S35 VN thing. Um, but you cut out right as you were kind of tying it into the last you a lifetime tidbit. Um, do you want to, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll just conclude the point to say that S35 is not really a last you a lifetime kind of steel. It's a very good steel and there's nothing wrong with it, but to make the argument that that now is heritage quality, that's what I struggle with. That's where I feel like we become a little dishonest. Mm -hmm. And looking at it, I think that there are steels that will get you there. Um, and there's some really forward-looking steels that will get you there. Vanax, for example. But your M390 class steels, 20 CV, I mean, these are these are used in, in large productions all over the place. I find them very easy to sharpen, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those feel like heritage quality. I think it's okay to say we use S35, deal with it. Just like Norse, Grimsmo uses RWL. And they're like, that, this is what we use to get this blade shape. And it's tough to do. Mm -hmm. Here's what we, I think that's fine. And, you know, no shade thrown at Chris Reeve knives for using S35. The, the shade, the pushback comes by saying, and this is the best thing for you, trust us. Because right. that I feel is becoming very dishonest. I think they have just, they're highly invested in that material. And the market is moving past that material that is no longer the cutting edge, but their story is that they are cutting edge. And so there's this tension now between their story and the materials that they're using. Yeah. And the, the, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it was just one last point there because, again, it's not about throwing shade at Chris Reeve knives. I think it's good just to acknowledge what some of the small makers are doing with steels right now. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of makers that are working with with very, very, very good steels, and they are solving the problems and putting in the hard work to figure out how to produce them in larger numbers and to get them into the hands of consumers and to have them have great geometry and great heat treatment. And I think that these makers deserve credit for what they're putting out. I mean, Hinder is obviously putting out knives in 20 CV in very large numbers. I mean, they're not, I don't think they're probably where Chris Reeve is, but maybe they're bigger. I don't know their production numbers but they're certainly putting out a lot of 20 CV and I'm not seeing a whole lot of people, you know, mail the knife back to them with a photocopy of their middle finger saying, how do I sharpen this thing? Do it for me. Right. That's not happening all that much. So it's a little bit of a false problem. I really think that we need to acknowledge the, the energy of the makers that are actually solving the problems on the cutting edge. I think Chris Reeve has a story that they're doing that, but I don't think they really are right now. Yeah, I think it, it kind of goes back to what I said towards the beginning about the market kind of demanding higher end steels at this point. And yes. I think that honestly stems a lot from the consumers just wanting to know more about the subject. And like it's I'm not a steel expert. I'm not a metallurgist. I try to to not go too deep into the weeds on on actual composition of steels because I I don't retain that information like I do other information that I find more interesting. But I do love hearing what other people say about it. 
watching steel testing videos and seeing how different steels perform in certain tests and how they compare to others that have done the same tests. And I think the, the people who are buying knives right now know way more about the difference between steels and it's, it's becoming harder and harder to trick people <laughs> into like 154 CM is fantastic. 154 CM is okay. It's not fantastic. And there's a ton of videos proving that it does not perform as well at the things that people realistically do with their knives often as other steels do that can be had on knives for the same amount of money or less. And so it, the idea that, like you said, their story is telling that S35 VN is what you need is just like, it's, it's some people rightfully don't care about the progression of steels. And that's fine if they don't. I've, I've met plenty of people who couldn't care less about all the steel talk. And they're like, it, my D2 knife still cuts just fine. It doesn't matter to me what blade steel the new knife is in. I'm going to enjoy it either way. But there are increasingly more and more people who do care about steels and who are learning about the differences between them. And there's like Laren, uh, is it Thomas or Thompson? Laren, uh, the knife steel nerds guy. He's yeah. published a book, which is fantastic about all of this information. And like, if you follow him, he's constantly coming out with new stuff on it. And then there's YouTube knife testers who are constantly doing these like field tests with knives and figuring it out. And it's all at our fingertips now, like it maybe wasn't before. And so I think over time, even the switch to S45 VN, this is something I said while you're trying to reconnect, that jump is not big enough. <laughs> it, right. The amount of Agreed. progression that for how long they've been behind with S35 VN, it is not justifiable to only jump up to S45 VN. And what I think has happened is, again, I think I looked on their site and it said that they were involved again with the creation of this steel. I think we're going to see them making a lot of the same talking points again, like they did with S35. Like, oh, we developed this steel for our knives and we know what's best. And it's like, if you look at the objective testing of S45 VN, it's frankly pretty underwhelming compared to a lot of the other super steels that currently exist. And so the idea that that's what they're leaping forward to, they're finally making a change after all of this time. And it's that, it's like, I... I don't, I don't get it. At the very least, what you can't support is a claim that it's the finest in the world and it's at the cutting edge because it really just is not. I would say for your listeners who want to dive in and go deeper into steel, you mentioned it. I think the Nice Steel Nerds, and I think it's just nicesteelnerds.com, mm -hmm. is such a great resource for people to go to. If you want to nerd out and know and understand what's under the hood, go there. And it won't all make sense at first, but you will get it. Um, if you don't care and you just want to cheat sheet, just tell me what numbers to look for on a blade for cutting edge right now. For a high-end knife, it's either 20 CV or M390. They're the same steel, just made in two different places, or Vanax. That right there is the cutting. And there's better tool steels. I know you love 3V and, and there's mm -hmm. some better ones. But if you see 20 CV, M390, or Vanax, on a high-end knife, you can know that that is actual cutting edge stuff that's going on right now. Right. Yeah, there's an interesting, so when I first made those videos about the Sabenza, I'm just thinking about this now, I had posted one of them into um, a Facebook group because some people in the group had watched it. So I think when I did like the final conclusion, I shared that video in there. And there was one guy in the comments who was real, real mad specifically about my comments on S35 VN. And in my final video, I had talked about how there was a list of other steels that I would prefer personally to have. And I, I tried to be somewhat delicate about it. Like this, these are the steels I would prefer. If you prefer S35 VN, okay, you're allowed to prefer that if you want. <laughs> like, like you said, you can sure. prefer burnt toast to properly cooked toast. But um, I made the point and I, I specifically said 3v in there along a list of other steels like to me 3v would be fine 4v would be fine l max would be fine m390 would be fine 20 cv would be fine there's a whole range of steels and there's yeah. like 10v is not even something we've even brought like rex 121 there are crazy steels that are beyond maximum there's in intense steels that really accentuate certain attributes that steel can get and do them incredibly well that are just below those parts of S35VN out of the water. But 
what I think is funny is this guy specifically drilled down on me saying 3V as an example of a steel I'd prefer to see the Sabenza in. And he was like, 3V, if if you like edge retention, it's not even it's it's not even close to S35VN, which first of all, it's pretty close to S35VN in edge retention. S35VN is not the king of edge retention. Um, no. but the toughness is is way tougher. And something I found just amusing about the whole interaction is a lot of people talk about the Sabenza like it's one of the toughest knives. Like it's bulletproof. It's just, you cannot destroy the thing. It will last forever. This kind of goes with it being an heirloom piece. Like it is an indestructible tool. Nonsense. That knife will break like any other knife. <laughs> it might yeah. be stronger yeah. than some other knives, but it is not the strongest knife. And if you're wanting to make the claim that like this knife is built to be tough and do any job. And that to me means like prying and doing like abusive things to your knife and three V for those tasks in my opinion and my experience would be better than S35 VN for it. So it's just funny because if you say S35 VN doesn't have enough edge retention, they're like, well, that's because it's supposed to be tough. And if you're like, well, S35 VN isn't that tough. And they're like, well, that's because they wanted to have edge retention. And it's like, I, I care less about like that delicate balance between ease of sharpening, especially and edge retention and toughness and stainlessness. I'd rather have, them like take a stance with their steel and even if they're not feeling like taking a stance m390 and 20 cv are very balanced they're still pretty stainless they have better edge retention they're still plenty tough and like we said there aren't issues that people are having with sharpening them it's with modern equipment you can sharpen these steels so no matter what way i look at s35 vn I'm okay with the steel in a lot of applications. I'm not okay with the idea of it being on a $450 knife and being plated to me as the best steel option for it. I, I disagree yeah. with people who say it's the best. I would add to that, that, I mean, there's a fundamental for people who are not knife steel nerds, there's a fundamental trade-off that you have that the, the, the chemistry of a knife that is very, very tough, and edge retention is almost the wrong way to say it. Really, it's can the knife hold its geometry and can't, does it resist abrasion and deformation? Mm -hmm. Because that's what edge retention is. And abrasion and deformation are two slightly different things, by the way. But in order to make it really, really strong, you, you don't leave room for the components that are also corrosion resistant. So the stronger knife is usually the quicker it's going to rust. Or... On the other side, the more brittle it's going to get. So yeah, it's real strong, but if you hit it wrong, it'll chip. Mm -hmm. And then the things that you add to make it corrosion resistant, um, to add into the chemistry of it, make it a little softer usually. And what you get at the cutting edge of this trade-off right now is that's what M390 and Van X are, for example is that they are extremely corrosion resistant, a factor of two or three X over S30 class steels, like S35. But they're also extremely resistant to abrasion and deformation. So they hold an edge and they don't break and they don't chip as easy. So you get a knife that you have to sharpen once a month or once every other month, as opposed to once every other use mm -hmm. um, of, of daily use, by the way, M390 is a magnificent steel in terms of its strength. It is strong and nasty as a box of hornets. And, but it also is corrosion resistant. And Chris Reeve himself in documentaries done on him says to the camera, I have people who are out in the bush, they're out in marine environments, and if this rusts on them, that is bad for us. And I took him at his word. I mean, to me, yes, I am I'm thumping my chest like Matthew McConaughey going, yes, Chris, yes, because a daily carry knife is going to get sweat, it's gonna get humidity if you live in many climates. Um, if you take it into a marine environment, I don't think people realize if you leave a D2 knife in your pocket on a beach day, it can be rusted, closed before you get home and you never pulled it out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. D2 is a very hard steel. It's just not corrosion resistant. So if Chris Reeve said this, it's unacceptable to have a knife corrode. To me, that says, then why are you not looking at M390 and Vanex? Because these are corrosion resistant steels. Are they allowed to use S35? Absolutely use it. 
but now we have to resolve the tension because what you've said you were doing, we're at the edge of technology, we're producing the finest thing in the world and it is unacceptable to have it corrosive. Okay, I hear you. Why aren't you delivering that? Why aren't you doing it? So that's what jumps out to me when I hear it. It seems like the soul of Chris wanted, he was, he was calling out for M390 five or six years before it existed. Why not jump on it immediately when now that it's available largely for the same price? Right. Give or take. Well, so it doesn't, that's my last thought. It doesn't fit their current story of being able to say that they helped develop it. That's such a, such a talking point for them. Yep. Yeah. What's interesting too is like S45VN seems to be kind of an evolution, if you will, of S35VN. Like I said, I don't think it's a, a remarkable improvement, but like, based on the idea that at Chris Reeve knives without Chris Reeve there recently, they have been improving on S 35 VN to make S 45 VN. Why would they not like start with 20 CV and create a new cool Chris Reeve knife company version of 20 CV yes. that they riffed on and enhance that a little bit. Why did yeah. they start with the integrated thing? Yeah, no one's doing production levels of Annex right now. Nobody. It's, quiet it's very hard years. to get, but yeah. But that's cutting edge. I mean, why not introduce it on one model that you can only reduce a limited number every year, but you're going to grow into it? That, that, to me, is in Chris Reeves' strategy right now, is create a new model that uses Vanex or a specific type of Sabenza 41 that uses Vanex and yeah, it's in limited number, but it's going to sell for it. You're going to buy it for 550 and it's going to sell in the secondary for 750. Right. And it's going to be desired. People will be fighting over copies of it. Mm -hmm. That is, to me is the spirit of the Chris Reeves in their own story. It's not. And here's a, here's S 45 and trust me, it's better for you. Right. Yeah. All right. So I feel like we've probably covered steel pretty well. I think it's apparent that neither you or I think that S35VN or S45VN are cutting edge, are top tier, are uh, leading the market. And for a knife brand that is priced like it should be leading the market, in, in my opinion, and is talking like it's leading the market and is talked about like it's leading the market, I think that's where it goes wrong with steel. Um, so the last thing that I have written on here, other than USA made, which we've also talked about quite a bit, is that they are like an established brand identity and company and that they have like a rich history behind them. So you've watched the documentaries. I actually haven't taken the time to do that, if I'm being honest. Um, what would you say your perception of like, their history and their, their brand identity. Do you think that adds value to them? Obviously it adds cost to them. They, they charge a, a good amount for that identity, but how do you feel about that category and the way people talk about it? Okay. So two, two big thoughts here. And one is, is part of the reason that I thought it was a good idea to come and expand the conversation about what is 400 to $550 of value in the knife world in 2021 look like. Mm -hmm. And using Chris Reed was not to come in and try to get negative because I have focused so much on positive content on what I do. Um, however, the reason why I thought it was okay to use them as a benchmark is because they have said out loud to the public, we are cutting edge. We want to produce the finest thing in the world. Hold us to the highest standard. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that that is part of their story. I think that the story of Chris Reeve knives that they tell is hold us to the highest standard in the world and we will meet it. Chris says, you know, if you want to go buy a Ford, go buy a Ford, but we're trying to make a Lamborghini and that's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Matthew McConaughey thumped my chest. I am in. Okay. So what happened? And yeah, I think their story is great. I love the Chris Reeve story. I love how that, you know, he came to the United States, he built something that could be held to the highest standard, would stand the test of time, something that he could be proud to put in the people's hands. He clearly takes or took a very, um, a huge amount of pride in providing this to armed forces and special forces members, um, specifically from the United States, but I'm assuming worldwide, although I, I don't think that information is public. Um, 
so yes, nothing but applause for me for their story. The, the tension that I'm feeling is that I think that they have lost their way compared to their story. There's a tension between their product and their story. So yeah, the story's good, but that's also the reason that we're here talking about it. Mm-hmm. Is, and, and at least for me, it's not, and so they suck, not at all. For me, it's more like, please come back to the cutting edge because that umnumzan, I want it to be what it should be. I want it to get its glass slipper and have its fairy godmother tap it on the shoulder and for it to bloom into what it can be. Mm-hmm. And it's not. And so that's point number one. My second point on their story is only that they're not the only beautiful story happening right now. Look at Ramon Chavez and what he's doing. Look at Enrique Pena and what he's doing from Laredo, Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Chavez is doing that from New Mexico. I mean, as far as I can tell, he's like half the New Mexico economy right now because that place is ground to a halt in the COVID land and he's mm-hmm. still cranking them out. You have uh, Brian Brown and the quality that he can produce from his little garage shop. Mm-hmm. Um, Rick Hinder has an incredible story, a farrier and a fireman who you know wanted to make something he could be truly proud of and put his hands on. Look at the story behind Olamic and how these two people you know, kind of stood this thing up and they created maybe the finest mid-tech that, that exists today. If you want to go offshore, look at the Danish designers behind Giant Mouse and Voxnaze and what they did, you know, learning how to sail even as younger men and, you know, Jens Anzo out there essentially designing knives when he was, I don't, I forget the age, it was like 11 years old, he was coming up with knife designs. You have Birch Tree, you know, who you are quite familiar with, who just put out a great production line. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's here in the States, I think in Louisiana. You have uh, Rayot, okay? And now look, I understand that they are a Chinese production facility, but they are not part of the problem. They are part of the solution. They are nerding out and figuring out how to make the finest cutting edge production knives And they are the wind beneath the wings of some brilliant American designers, giving them relevance and lift in a marketplace right now. And when a designer like Brian Brown on his Jaeger M knife, and he took that one instead of, you know, because he can only do so many customs so fast. And he goes to Rayot to help him machine his parts and put together the Jaeger M. And he brings it back and tunes it up and does his QC and sends it out. And he created a knife that is so fine that this Jaeger knife can stand up against a knife at any price category. Hand me a $1,300 knife and let me give you this Jaeger M. You open them both, not knowing which one costs $1,300 and five times out of 10 or more, they will pick the little $350 production knife that was an American designer partnering with Rayot. That is a hell of a story. And so whether we wanna keep the story on the shores and make it, make it America only, or we want to go to the Danish designers like Giant Mouse and Jens Anzo and Jesper Voxnes, or we want to look at the partnerships that are forming between uh, Chavez and Pena and Olamic and off-seas partners that they have. Those stories are amazing too. Those are great stories and good people that are trying to solve the problems at the cutting edge that you can support. That I, oh, Joseph Vero, I forgot to mention. Yep. Um, Joseph Vero has, has had a meteoric rise and is producing, I think, some of the most exciting things in knives right now, completely original designs, fun to handle, beautiful, uh, brilliant materials. He's a knife nerd, an American knife nerd, producing knives for other knife nerds across the world. And yep. his stuff is so hard to get a hold of and it's increasing in value because demand so far outstrips supply. And it is him and his wife and they are live broadcasting on Instagram from like their first shop. If that's not a story you can get excited about, then you don't actually care about story. So yes, is Chris Reeves' knife story good? Yes, it is. And and good on them. Is it the only story out there? No, there's a rich, rich bunch of stories there for you to join into that are producing equal or better quality, objectively, objectively better quality knives. You may not prefer them, but objectively, they're better materials, better actions, all of those things that make it. So that's where I go with that question. I like that. Yeah, I uh, one story I'd recommend that you check out if you haven't, both you and the listeners, um, the Koenig story. I think it's listed on their site in kind of the about section, but Bill oh, Koenig. I don't, know it. I don't know it. 
phenomenal, phenomenal story dealing with like the death of his father. And it was his dream to do this with him. And then it's like this whole thing. And they're literally in the same state <laughs> as Chris Reeve knives and, and small and grassroots and, and trying hard with amazing ethic. And it's, they're, they're a cool story as well. But yeah, I think you're right. I think I believe that the Chris Reeve knife company story used to be true. And I, I think for a long time it was, I think for a long time they were on the cutting edge and I think you're right that they either need to catch up and be cutting edge again, or they need to start telling their current story. That's where the disconnect is. In it's my a mind. hard but good point. Because the, I think the story is old. It's outdated. I don't think the stuff that, uh, that makes up their talking points, all of these, these uh, proposed advantages to getting a CRK compared to another knife stack up in 2021. I think frankly, they probably haven't stacked up in at least five years, had a real case of being like th that they're pushing the envelope and that they're, they're yeah. seeking greatness. I think what they're doing is they're continuing to make the same knives that they used to, and it's gone from cutting edge to heritage brand. I think it, it has gone from mm -hmm. we are trying to make the fastest motorcycles on the road to we're going to be Harley Davidson, and we're going to keep making the same motorbike for the same fans who liked that motorbike for a long time or for new fans who are into like retro old motorbikes. There's, mm -hmm. there's no there's no way to make the argument that Harley Davidson makes the fastest motorcycle right now on the road or a racetrack. And that's not their focus. Right. And I think Chris Reeve knives clearly, clearly their focus is not to move the ball down the field. They just want to hold up the ball and celebrate. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I'm not against that. What I'm against is that they're still, telling the story. I think it's also like the fans are just as to blame as the company here where people keep talking about them and recommending them to new people who haven't experienced one like they are still cutting edge and they just, I think demonstrably aren't right. But like if you update that story and you start saying we're a heritage brand, just like GEC makes slip joints, right? They're not trying to make modern, like cutting edge knives. They're, they're trying to keep making an old thing that satisfies a different type of like nostalgia or like a different type of preference than I need what's new and, and what's hot. They're not doing anything new and hot. They might That's offer a great point and they're hard to find. They increase in value. So the market clearly appreciates sure. GEC being honest about who they are. It, it, Absolutely. I, I, I appreciate it. I think it's a great thing, even though I'm not into slip joints. If I was going to get one, I got to handle two of them today with my buddy, Nick, I would probably pick one of those. They felt nice. They were very good. It, slip joints aren't really my style, but like if I want a slip joint, that's probably where I'm going to go. If I want a, a knife that feels nineties era, instead of like my grandpa's knife, it might feel like my dad's knife <laughs> um, or like my older brother's knife. I don't know. Like a nineties era knife to me is a Chris Reeve knife. Even if you're talking about the Zan and the 31 and all these new models, I feel like they're just riffing on the same old stuff. And so they need to either update the story. Yeah, there's nostalgia baked in there. I will agree with you on that one. And so, I, I very much agree. And I would say though, that there are a lot of nostalgia makers that are that are using better materials and creating all in all better quality knives. And I would look at Enrique Pena. If you're looking for a nostalgia knife that is actually on the cutting edge of what's happening, mm -hmm. it is hard to find a better knife than what Pena is putting out right now. Right. So yeah, I completely uh, agree. I think that's a great way to look at it. And I, I just want to be really careful that even though it sounds critical, I mean, for me, it's more like, for me, it's more like us wrestling with the tension between their story and their claims and their product. And I think that the spirit that Chris Reeves started this thing with, and the reason that he looked up to the aerospace industry, he brags often about hiring the quality control engineers from the aerospace industry. And then they came in and they're like, wow, you're tougher than what I came out of. To me, what that story, when I hear him tell it, 
what that story is about is the same thing if you've ever read the book, um, The Right Stuff, which was the original test pilots that led to the Mercury missions at NASA. And it was this idea that we're taking this thing to the edge. We are hot dogging it. We are flying high and fast and hard. And you know what? It's dangerous being up there. And not everybody's going to like working here because we're so demanding of what we do. But if it's in your blood, you're going to love to be here. See, I celebrate that. I want to love that about Chris Reeve Knives. That gets my heart pumping mm -hmm. without revealing too much just about my background. I do have some experience working in that, in the space exploration industry um, as a consultant. And I, it makes me proud to hear that level of talk mm -hmm. and to, to have that compared to pulling that Zon out of the box after all that time waiting to acquire one. And that to me is the tension of this conversation. But what Chris was when he said those things, I think he was asking to be held to the highest standard. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the company now is at all interested in being held to a very high standard in terms of their competition, in terms of what's going on. And I will even go one step further since we've already thumped the hornet nest and we're two some hours into this thing. If any knife nerds have hung on this long, <laughs> I will say that his son, who's now running the company, seems like a great guy. I do not know him personally. I've never talked with him not here, not Chang. He's one of the few makers that I haven't had some kind of contact with of the, of the big guys out there. But I don't see in him a passion to make the finest knives in the world for an adoring knife fan audience. Mm -hmm. And this is not a, a, a direct critique of him. It's just somebody needs to say it. If you go watch his interviews, I've watched every interview I could find with him, both podcasts and on YouTube, Vimeo, anywhere I could find an uploaded video because I wanted to understand what made him tick. And if anything, I see a guy who doesn't necessarily understand his audience. He almost is a little apologetic or kind of pokes a little fun at guys who would buy $5,000 customs from them and would buy multiple knives. And I, by the way, I kind of get that. You know, there are some knives I see people buying. I'm like, why on earth would you buy that? So I'm not going out and, you know, I'm not trying to, to throw shade at him for that. But I will say that it, I don't sense a deep spiritual connection to the product or to the purchasers that I saw in Chris. Take mm -hmm. out what you want on Chris. He was a surly guy by all anecdotes, but he really wanted to make the finest thing in the world. And that's not the spirit that I see coming out of the leadership of CRK. And again, I don't say that to be super critical of him there because um, he seems like a really sweet guy. I don't know what it's like to work for him. I, I haven't talked to anybody. There's there's nothing like that. But just looking in from the outside as a consumer, it feels like the soul isn't there in the same way. And what I would say is there are designers out there that are begging for your business. They are staying up. They are obsessing over the last 10 thousandths of an inch on everything that they do. They are up at 4 a.m., posting Instagram lives, producing knives that I think are some of the finest at any price point and producing them at the four to $500 range, which is unthinkable a decade ago. These guys deserve your grail money. And these knives will please you and last longer than the CRKs that you're chasing on the swaps mm -hmm. that you're going to. So, you know, put your money into the people that are so passionate that their eyes are bleeding over it. So that's what comes out to me as we kind of wrap up and look at that story. Yeah, I like that. I uh, Let me ask you a, a question that I think might illustrate maybe <laughs> where I see Chris Reeve Knives actually sitting, being a, a heritage brand and not a current brand. Like they, they make the Harley, they make the 1911, they make the air-cooled Porsche, whatever you want to call it. They don't make the knife of today, which is fine if that's what they want to make. If you bought a, a new Sabenza right now, a 31, wow. and, and it arrived. And instead of having the expectation of it being a current leader in what you can get in a knife, if instead you were paying, albeit a premium, for a knife that was period correct for early <laughs> 2000s, late 90s, and you were buying a heritage, like nostalgic piece not so far back that it's a traditional, but like 
from when the Reeve Integral Lock was created and from when right. S35VN was the greatest steel that had been used in knives yet. If you were getting a correct representation of what that knife really was in a box and you got to open it up and you got to feel what the action was really like back in the day when that's the way that knives were like that's that was the pinnacle at the time would it feel different than or better even than opening it and expecting it to be in competition with even just to be as fair as possible a brand new triway pivot hinderer xm18 yeah it's such a great question jake it really is and my answer is here's the most honest answer i can give yeah it would make a big difference for sure, because expectation is part of it. And I bond, I like Chris Reeves' story. It's the reason I'm willing to talk so strong here is that I want to see him get back to it. Mm -hmm. I really do. But I would not pay 550 bucks for a period correct 1990s knife. I wouldn't do it. Um, so yes, it would make a difference. I also wouldn't pay it. If yes. the Sabenza, which I think is the best in their line now, um, and if they if they got the Zahn's design flaws correct, if they just went, you know what, <laughs> we, we we really screwed up. We got a little high ego. We mm -hmm. zend out about it. We're gonna we're gonna chamfer that edge just a little better. Um, or maybe don't even say that. Instead, just say we focus on constantly making improvements to our product. Exactly. Yeah. Like, Zahn three point Everybody uh, else does. Spiderco does CQI like mid production yeah. run. Hinderer is constantly introducing new things. That doesn't mean Rick Hinderer's out there like all my old knives are garbage guys. I found out they suck. Exactly. So now I made a new one that's better. No, he's saying like, look at this new feature that we found a way to include. Look yes. at this improvement that we made. It's, it's that's yeah. just a plating issue. Like, so if they came out with Zahn 2.0 and Sabenza 41 and Sabenza 41 had two thumb studs that were a little bit larger and actually made for human fingers. And the Zahn had that reworked lock bar on it. I think that the Sabenza would be a great knife at $275 up there with the Pena's. Sure. For what and it is. And I think work, Zahn, start doing some internal milling, start using better blade steel, start using these yeah. things that make knives add up to that amount. And then it's fair. But I think you're right. At 275 bucks, that seems. Yep. And the Zahn in 20 CV would be 375 to 425, depending on the milling work and, and how well you sold it. Obviously, there's going to be a premium there. Mm -hmm. And I, I think at those prices, those knives make a lot of sense as heritage kind of offerings. Mm hmm. Yep. And if you got, if you got real, I mean, imagine this, I mean, let me just imagine a Sabenza with LC 200 in um, washers in it, mm -hmm. titanium frame lock with a Van X blade cut as beautiful as it is with, with a, at least one great thumb stud on it. Mm -hmm. Imagine for a moment. Now that is a $550 knife that you could, you couldn't find for less than 625 or 650 on a swap until they could just saturate the market, which at their pace takes them, you know, four or five years. Right. That is a knife that you go, who boy, how do I get a hold of that? That CRK, that is making America proud. So yeah, I mean, we want to talk about that. That is because a sailor could take that Sabenza, literally store it at night in a cup full of salt water by his bed, wake up in the morning, spit on it, mm -hmm. Take it back to work and then put it back in the salt water. And that thing is not going to corrode and it's going to hold its edge geometry as long as any steel on the market right now. Yeah. Um, outside of a few. Now that's exciting to me. That to me is a $550 edge of the envelope knife. That, that knife is worth bringing in aerospace engineers and the guys who, who were studied in that, um, in the right stuff, you know, the story that was written, it, you know, it's more or less a documentary. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit of those boys. In there and, and those those women too um that's the spirit that they have i would love to see that come back into play and the good news is is that it is there it is absolutely all over the market with these other makers it's just not there with crk right now yeah which is a great point because like i made a point to write down a whole bunch of other makers and maybe we can kind of end on this note i know it's <laughs> it's been um it's not my longest podcast, but we're going. Um, I wrote down a list just off the top of my head. This is definitely isn't even everybody, but of other U.S. companies 
there's the obvious competitors like Hinderer and Strider. And then some people might consider Medford a competitor. That's one of the few brands I'd say I have <laughs> less affinity I'll take for. Okay, thank you. Um, then there's Demco. There's Microtech, who makes US-made knives, right? And they make autos, but they also, I, they haven't made it in a while, but like the Sigil, I think. That was me, great. I like it way better than I like the Sabenza. So they, they're yeah. capable, right, at Microtech. And Bench I'd like to see them. And there is at that level of the Sigil as well. Yeah, so Benchmade is actually literally the next one. And I specifically yeah. wrote Anthem. I have one of those on the way that I just traded for. And I've reviewed one before that was a loner. Yeah. I like it's that. A great knife. Well, even if you hate Benchmade, the Anthem was their pinnacle work, and yep. it was absolutely up there next to the Sigil or the Sabenza. No and it's not—it's not a perfect knife. The, the, I, nope. I, I wouldn't make that claim, but it's an integral with a titanium. It's a, an integral titanium frame with a specific type of axis lock that doesn't use omega springs. So it's—I would say superior yeah, heavy duty spring axis lock, and. It has 20 CV blade steel, a great blade profile. The finishing is fantastic. The milling is nicer than it is on any Sabenza. Like, it's a very, very nice. So Benchmade is doing it in the U.S. Spyderco is doing it in the U.S. Yeah. Frankly, the knives that they make that compete in the Tai-Zong. range are from Taichung. But still, they have a whole U.S.-made line that I think makes great knives that I love and enjoy. Koenig, U.S. Skiff is a small kind of underground person that I I think is frankly probably going to blow up relatively soon because they're making phenomenal knives and components, but their finished bearings are the best on the market. It's the best $12 upgrade you can ever give to one of your knives is Skiff bearings. Have you handled one of their actual knives? I have not. I have not been able to. You need to. There. So today, the buddy I hiked with was carrying one. I got to play with it. It's actually the second or third time I've seen his. He carries it like every day and uses it all the time. It's awesome. And then my buddy Alex has another one. They are phenomenal knives from a small U.S. shop that's just doing incredible stuff. And then there's ZT is U.S. made. And ZT is on their own path, it seems, but they're making us made knives and they've done some stuff that i think compares a little more with this range but not so much anymore um mcnees is a u.s maker who with his new mac 2 that guy is crushing it like they're yeah not great blade steel on that one i was surprised but but design wise excellent yeah and for a small like autonomous like he can make that change you know and it's just it's something compelling and different and then there's spartan which Spartan has worked, I, I think they have somewhat of a relationship with Chris Reeve Knives in that they've kind of used them to lean on for asking questions and things, and they seem to be friends over there. But Spartan is making a lot of knives that have some of kind of the soul of older Chris Reeve Knives, in my opinion, like the way that they're on washers and I would agree the with that. Box. but they're also doing button locks <laughs> with aluminum frames. It's still S35VN. They've also bumped to S45. I'd love to see that enhance as well, but they're doing different stuff, also US made. There's companies like Grimsmo, and there's there's a whole bunch of others. ProTech, like all of these companies are also US made, have US made staff. I, I'd wager that most of them are trying to use US materials where possible. They're doing all this stuff. And that's not even getting into the non US competitors like Olamic, who's half US, half not. And they're also not China, if that matters. There's yeah. Riat, who's absolutely destroying it right now. They're crushing it in terms of their collaborations with U.S. designers to bring U.S. design knives to market here in the U.S., sold by U.S. businesses. I would love it if they were made in the U.S. and were that nice, but they aren't. And and they can't be because there's no one in the U.S. who can produce these knives for these U.S. designers like Riat can in terms of quality, timeline, budget, any of that. So say what you will about Riat, they're crushing it. We, Best Tech, these other manufacturers who are also pairing with US designers. So depending on where people want to draw their own line, I think you're absolutely right in your points that like, it's it's not all Chris Reeve or nothing if you want a, a nice US made knife, or if you want to broaden your horizons and say just a nice knife. Like, I think if people take good looks at what these other companies offer and especially some of these sleepers like skiff who i mentioned and um koenig is like not that much more than a sabenza if you can get one on a drop on the secondary market i have seen them for 550. the skiffs uh no 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 the koenig 
Oh, okay. Um, so on the secondary, and that's the thing on the secondary, on the secondary market, you can find a Chavez um, custom occasionally in that Sabenza ish price range. Mm -hmm. uh, now I know that with, with Chavez, you know, you either love or you hate the clip, but just, just to know, right. Cause it's got that skull clip on it that starting next year, all of his even production knives through Rayot are going to come with two clip options. One that's a non. So yeah, I mean, even then you don't have to love it or hate it. You can just try it out. Now that may be too thick for your taste, but the, I mean, excellent, excellent work there. And you can find his customs in that price range. Mm -hmm. You will find Pena customs in that 550 price range on the secondary market. Yep. Yeah, get yourself a custom Pina Mula and tell me it's not better than <laughs> some Oh, man. And I was actually just going to say the Olamic Wayfair, the custom Pina Mula, also the Rayot Production Pina Mula yep. uh, that's there. The um, What Weir Knives is doing with some of their stuff. Exactly, right there. These knives right here are so good and they bring so much joy to interact with. And that is why I did not even, for my page, as beautiful as I find is on, there's a reason I didn't even take a picture of it because I didn't want to endorse what it is now. now again, not that you can't love it. And I have no shade on you if you love it. Some people, I mean, there are people out there that are still driving the old BW bugs around. So, you know, the quirkier, the better if you want to just do it. Mm -hmm. But that's why I didn't even take a picture of it because I felt like that would have been very dishonest. That mula that you just held up, I mean, you have to, there's not a whole lot of copies out there now, but you could buy almost two of those for the price of a single Sabenza. And they have just incredible materials, construction, and Enrique Pena is the kind of guy that is a good guy to support in this business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think... I literally, the, the best way for my like kind of car brain that I can put it is if I, uh, there's a lot of analogies for Chris Reeve knives, but I think of it like an air cooled Porsche and mm -hmm. I happen to really like old air cooled Porsches. I think they're fantastic cars and there's a lot of, a lot about their kind of quirkiness and difference that makes them engaging and cool. And, uh, I, I dig them. I used to go to car meets specifically for air cooled Porsches. I, I get the affinity for that. Um, th you can spend more on an air cooled Porsche <laughs> that is in okay shape than you would going to buy a brand new off the showroom floor Porsche 911 Carrera, which is faster to 60, quicker around a corner, way more comfortable to drive, has all the modern amenities. It, you can spend more on the old air cooled one for the nostalgia and for it being somewhat limited and for it being what it is. Right. And to some people on certain products that makes sense to do like one day, would I love to have an air cooled Porsche? Yes. But right now it doesn't make any sense for that to be a car that's on my radar. There's there's, it would be so irresponsible for me to pick that compared to things that actually bring me utility and are actually comfortable to drive around. I don't have a garage space just sitting around where I could park it when I'm driving my actual daily. Cause I probably wouldn't want a daily, that kind of car. Like if I, if I try to understand that Chris Reeve knives is like the air cooled Porsche, I can understand that people like them and people want to have them because there's nostalgia behind them. But when it doesn't make sense is when people try to say that they're like the modern nine 11, because right. I, I do not think that they are. I think that they're very far from being a modern showroom floor 911, regardless of what version you get out of their current catalog, whether it's a Sabenza or a Zan or a, a, whatever the other one is called. Um, I just, I don't think that they're, that they're there. Um, so hopefully that's insightful in some way as we're bringing this to an end for people, the, the comments that we've each made about it. Um, I, I hope it helps because I really wish that I would have been able to eavesdrop and then participate in this conversation before I bought my first CRK. Because at this point, I have owned five or six different copies. It might be seven. Um, but I, I have certainly owned them. I've earned my stripes talking about them. I wish that I could have participated in that conversation. And what I know about you, Jake, something I deeply respect about you is you are not a one-way broadcast to your audience. And I, I love the perspective that you take because you are willing to have that conversation with anybody who's not just 
lashing out at you said something I disagree with, so you're bad and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, this is a conversation that I hope does not just end between you and I. I hope that we can get more honest talking about the knife makers that are really doing something special. I think Gavco could have been mentioned in there and it wasn't, mm -hmm. um, that are doing really, really special work and those who are not. And to have that discussion in a way that's not nasty, it's not ugly, but that helps point people in the right direction. So when they spend that 550 bucks and they really stretch for something that they can be proud of, that they feel like they have a place to go. Mm -hmm. that's what I hope. I hope that the conversation it just gets bigger from here and that it doesn't get shouted down and that people don't hear a critique of their judgment because they bought CRK. If that's true, then I'm the stupidest guy in the room because I've owned more than most people who ever buy CRK. Yeah. Do. So, you know, I'm the, I'm the chief dunce cap there. Um, and, and I think it's also fair for, it's also fair for people to have listened to this and, and to have heard all the things we said and to still come to the conclusion that they would like to have one. And, yeah, and I still prefer it. Which is and I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Like, as with most of my kind of negative knife reviews, when they end, I usually like to make a point of saying that, like, I kind of celebrate it that there is a variety in the market of knives, and that there is stuff that I don't like because that means more people can be included in the hobby than people who have my taste. And I think that's yeah. a really good thing. But what I, what I agree with you on is that I think there should be more honesty about like the categorization of certain things and in the type of talking points we use about stuff for people who haven't yet experienced them. Because I feel like there's a number of places in the CRK conversation where to me, it just doesn't seem totally honest. And like, I have never held a CRK knife and felt like this is absolute junk. It shouldn't exist. Like there's no safety hazard about it. There's nothing about it that is like horrifically ugly. It, for me, I, there's a lot that I don't like about it, but the, other people are allowed to like those things. That's, that's a totally fine response to all of this. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and I'll yeah. even tell you that if, if the Zahn, lives up to the dream that was Chris Reeve knives like you know the right stuff in the spirit of the edge of the envelope that exists there I will be the first person in line beating down the door sending emails hey how do I get a hold of this one and they're gonna go weren't you that jackass that got on that one podcast and talked about how the dream wasn't alive and they're not gonna give it to me and I will cry because that is the knife I want so for me it's completely warm-hearted it's generous-hearted but it's just trying to be real about it because I don't think we serve the audience when you push people toward those types of purchases and then they go, this is all I get for 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. That I, I just, I have a moral issue with it. And I, for whatever reason, we just haven't been talking about it. Been yeah. letting people spend their money there. And these other guys who are trying to launch out and go full time, like Joseph Hero, who are trying to launch out. He just went full time. He quit his day job to make some of the most exciting knives here is somebody to give that money to that will give you joy every day. Mm -hmm. So, well, good. I, uh, I feel satisfied with having gotten a lot of this out. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, chat, brother. it's one of those conversations that I just find myself having a lot. So maybe I can even, when someone starts to want to engage on the subject of Chris Reeve knives with me, I can point them toward this podcast. And then if they want to talk about it more after, they'll have a good understanding of where I come from on it. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a, a good resource, hopefully that we're putting out into the ethos, if you will, where there's a ton of just blanket positivity about something that doesn't deserve to be dragged through the mud per se. But I think it's good that we created a little bit of a different perspective, hopefully through this. And I don't know, I think it's been healthy for, for me, hopefully for you as well. Yeah, they're gonna wear out your downvote button, buddy. Like it's gonna <laughs> happen. I uh, I'm no stranger to that, and and uh, one of the primary motivations of this podcast, there are a few, but one of them is having the space and the ability to long form talk about things in in this arena, in the world of knives that are controversial, and to do it unapologetically share my opinion, have the guests share their opinion, whether it's the same or different, and uh, I think it's good to create a space where it's okay to tackle subjects like this, where it, uh, we're not the first people to 
speak in in somewhat negative terms about Chris Reeve knives. We've said things that are are not the m- most fanboyish here tonight, but I I don't think well, any. You're gonna try to shoot your horse, buddy. <laughs> you're gonna be walking that saddle back to town. But I'm none glad, of them, yeah, I'm none of them have been long form like this, and so I I like that we've been able to take the time to talk through it, get in the weeds a little bit, and just see what happens. Yes, man. Good. Good luck to you. And and just from my perspective, I love the content that you're putting out. I think we do a really bad job, especially uh, as men, speaking for men as we age, um, expressing gratitude to the people who use their time and their energy to give us things that we care about. And I have a lot of gratitude for how you're building out your channel and the types of reviews that you do. You know, I appreciate you putting your energy into it. I'm excited to see where you take it. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. And to throw a little compliment back your way. I, uh, I appreciate the chats we have because this is just one example, frankly, of us getting a little bit deep. And this is the longest we've talked for sure. Usually it's one minute voice notes back and forth on, on Instagram and stuff. But the way your mind works, the way you look at subjects, I find is a little bit similar to mine. I think our, our brains definitely work in a similar pattern, but you have very unique insights that help me in my review process. And you're one of the most advantageous for people for me to talk to as I'm reviewing a knife uh, and, and looking at things through your perspective, as much as I'm able to get from the way we communicate is very helpful to me, uh, much like other people that I, I talk to all the time, but specifically, I, I really appreciate our conversations and, and your written reviews on Instagram, which is a perfect segue to say that you can follow MB wild on Instagram. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, he'll be linked down below as long as you're okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me just say, I know there's just us in the room here, but you know that same thing extends the ability to dig in with curiosity and to dig into this world not only through photography but of EDC of knife and knife manufacturers the conversations that I've been able to have off uh, kind of off the grid with different makers and designers I have nothing but gratitude for that but this is just a little side project for me and you know is a is a COVID project. And the tribe that has been there and the kind of conversations that have happened have been very, very special. And I just, anyone listening, I just want you to know that I very, very much appreciate the warmth that I have received. And I think it's what makes the CDC world extremely unique. Absolutely. Well, MB, thank you so much. My front door is opening. Our timing is perfect. My wife is coming in right now. But this has been a ton of fun. So again, MB Wild will be linked down below if you're watching this on uh, YouTube. If you're listening to this, then you'll just have to search MB Wild on uh, on Instagram. So that'll be that. This has been a long one again. I imagine most of my podcasts will be, but this has been a lot of fun. Thank you all so much for listening or watching, whichever you did, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon.